First of all, we will start by setting up our database management system. And for the purpose of this uh, course, I will be using Docker and I will show you how you can install PostgreSQL or MySQL uh, database. So you have multiple choice. Also, if you have them already installed on your machine, you can skip this part. So this part is only about installing and setting up the d database management system on your machine. So uh, first of all, make sure that you have Docker desktop running, uh, installed and running. And here, like when you open the Docker uh, dashboard you will see this green uh, part like here or this green icon so this means that the engine is running so if it's an orange uh, color means that the engine is whether it's starting or it's not started so you need to make sure that this is green and this is all you need to do okay now let's let's move and uh, install the docker image for PostgreSQL. The command that we need to run is the following. So here we need to use the command docker run and then minus D to be to say uh, we want it to be running uh, in detached mode. So we don't want to wait for it. And now we want uh, our docker image to be persistent or to have a persistent volume within our system. Because as you know, every time you start a docker image, it will, st it will start like uh, from scratch and it will consider that nothing uh, is persistent. So if we want to have a persistent Docker volume, you need to add this option, minus V, it's for volume. And now for the volume, first of all, you need to specify the path where you want to store the, the data of uh, PostgreSQL and for example, in my case, so it will be in here. So I just called it this way. It's my personal project data slash PG uh, for post degree and data for data. And then just colon here and slash var. So here we are trying to map the volume from our local machine to the volume that post degree SQL will be using. Okay. So uh, it will be slash var slash lib slash post degree SQL slash data. So this is the path that post degree SQL uses to store the data. Okay. So now we mapped already the, the volume. Now we can also pass some environment variable. Uh, so, and these environment variables, we need them for uh, the username and the password. Okay. So to pass an environment variable, it's like following it's minus E. And then we have post degree underscore username. These are predefined uh, environment variable that post degree SQL will look for. And here I will call it just post degrees or post degree. And then minus E, I want to pass a second uh, environment variable. And this one, it will be a post degree password. Okay. It's a post degree underscore password. And here I will call it Alibu coding the, uh, for the password. Okay. And now we need to map the port. So, so this means on which port we want to run our application. So let's keep it the default one, which is for five, four, three, two colon five, four, three, two. Okay. So we will be using, or we will be connecting to uh, our post degree SQL on the port five, four, three, two. Okay. So now all, all we need to do now is to precise or to specify the image name, which is in our case, like we said, we want to use Postgres. So it's, it's going to be Postgres. Now let's hit the enter button and see how it will, it will do. So here it says that, uh, unable to find the image Postgres, Postgres latest locally. So it will be pulling it from a uh, library slash PostgreSQL. So means it will download the, um, the image. And now we see that we have this status downloaded image or new image from post degree, uh, latest. And here we have the hash of the image. Also, you can, you can go to Docker dashboard and you will see here that we have this image. And if you go to containers, you will see the container which is running. Okay. So 
and here you can see that we have this container which is up and and running okay so to install my sql uh, using docker we will follow the same steps so it will be docker run minus d as uh, d for detached and now we want our database or we want our image to be persistent or to have a persistent volume so we can also precise the minus v which stands for volume and i want my volume or more my persistent volume to be in this uh, in this path so it's up to you to choose where you want to have your persistent volumes and then colon slash var slash uh, lib slash my sql slash data so this is what my sql uses uh, for, for data and now we need also to precise some environment variables uh, and in this case or with, for my sql if we do not precise uh, for example the username it will take the root uh, as default username so i will i will keep it just uh, just root so i will only precise my sql or this or this environment variable which is the root password okay so it's my sql underscore uh, root underscore password uh, equals and i will keep it empty or you can leave it empty so i want to have an empty password for my sql uh, next we need to, to we need to precise the port so it will be 3306 mapped also to 3306 okay and then of course the image it's my sql or my sql okay now let's hit button and it will download or pull the image so now it's, it's extracting and in just a few seconds it will be done and we will be able to see the hash so this is this is the digest or the sha of um, of the pulled image and this is the id of the image and also to make sure that everything was fine and okay you can go to image refresh in here and you can see what we have the mysql running and it's already in use so if you click on this one you will see it here that it's up and running okay to create a new spring boot project the the recommended way and also the way that i really recommend is to go to the spring initializer website which is at this address start.spring.io and here you have a graphic user interface or website where you, that you can use to create a spring boot project okay so let's go ahead step by step and create our spring boot project so first of all you can choose which um which project um first of all you can use which dependency manager you want to use so if you want a maven or gradle project or here you have also the option for gradle kotlin for people that want to use kotlin instead of java and here you can also uh, specify the language java kotlin or groovy so for us we will go for the standards which is maven and java uh, for this tutorial or for this course because spring 3 is already out so we will be from now on we will be using the spring 3 version okay now let's specify or precise the project metadata so here the group id it will be um, let's call it com.alibu coding and the artifact let's call it because this is a spring data jpa course i will call it just jpa so this is spring uh, and the description you can leave it or you can put whatever you want so let's just leave it and this will be our base package or the package name so we want a jar packaging and of course we will use the java 17 for our project okay now let's add uh, some dependencies that we will need within our project so first of all we need spring data jpa and for the people that would be using PostgreSQL, just choose PostgreSQL driver. For the people that they want to use the MySQL, just go ahead with the MySQL driver. Okay. Uh, next, we need Lombok. 
So Lombok, it's, as you know, it's an annotation which helps us to reduce the boilerplate code. And I will be explaining uh, all the annotations that we will use within our project. And also I will add uh, Spring Web just in case um, we need, for example, to, to if you want to need to expose some uh, controllers or something like that, you can you can use the Spring Web. OK, so now once everything is set up, you have all the dependencies, you have uh, all the metadata and you configured everything. So we can first go and explore the project before downloading it. And as you can see here, we have all the information. So if the parent is a Spring Boot starter parent with the version 3. And here we have the group ID and the artifact that we precised. By default, the version is 001 snapshot. And the name is JPA. OK. Also, we have the properties, Java 17, and so on and so forth. And here we have all the dependencies that we want to use. And in the end, we have this build plugin, which is the default one from the Spring Boot framework. And yeah. OK, so now let's just go ahead and click on download and open our project using IntelliJ or your preferred IDE. To connect to our database, there are so many ways to do it. My preferred way, I want to have everything in one place. So I always go with the database option within IntelliJ. So by the way, this is the new interface. So you can download the latest version and enable the beta UI and you will, ha you will have the same, uh, the same view as me. Uh, okay, so let's go back to our database. So in order to connect, uh, you have this um, menu right here, which called database. But if you don't see it, um, you can go to view and then you have tool window. And then you can see here database. So if you click on database, it will it will open up this this window right here. All right. So now let's create or connect to our data source. Let's start with uh, PostgreSQL. So just click on this plus icon. Let me make it a bit bigger like that. So uh, when you click on data source, you have here a list of um, of databases or uh, databases uh, management system. So here, for example, you can also filter type PostGre uh, to filter for PostGre SQL and then click on it. OK, so this window will show and here we will have a default name which is uh, postgres localhost and here you can you can add some comments uh, you can also see the connection type which is default and the driver which is postgre sql driver so this is not the driver that we included to our pom.xml but it's the driver needed by IntelliJ or the, um, the database view system that you want to use uh, to, to be able to connect to the database. So um, here uh, you have PostgreSQL, but for the first time it will, it, it might require you to download the driver. So just go ahead and click on download the, the driver. It will be in the bottom here next to the test connection. And now let's go and configure our database. So as you remember from the previous um, part, we when we set up our PostgreSQL, we chose the default port, which is 5432. And then we chose a uh, username and password. So for the username, we said it's post gray. And for the for the password, we chose Alibu coding as a password. OK, now just go and click on test connection once you provide all the correct information. So if you used a different port in here, just precise it. Same for the local host and so on and so forth. So when you click on test connection, so you need to expect this succeeded. Otherwise, you have something wrong, whether the password or something like that. So let's do apply. OK, and let's check what we have in here. So here we see that we have our post degree SQL and here you have uh, one of three schemas or one of three databases. So these also are my old databases or the one that I'm using for uh, other projects. So now the first thing, let's go ahead and create our database. OK, so right click and then new 
and then you choose database to create the new schema. Uh, let's call it um, let's call it data JPA, okay? Data underscore JPA because this is the purpose of uh, of this course. Now just click OK. It's updating or creating the database, and then all you need to do click on this uh, zero of three icon and then just select the public so you have you will have the public schema by default okay and then every uh, in the in the future or when we create a new table it will appear under this public right here okay so now we have our postgresql set up and running within our application so let's move to the next for the students or for the users that prefer using MySQL instead of PostgreSQL, so in the same way you have this icon right here that represents the database. When you click on it, it will open a window like that. But if you can see it, just go to View menu and then Tool Windows, and then you will see Database. Just click on it, and you will have this view available for you. All right, now let's click on this plus icon to add a new data source. And here, like I have it uh, already in the recent used, but also you can filter by typing MySQL and it will pop up. Okay, so uh, then you need to precise the same information that you gave when, when creating the Docker image. So the local host or the host, it's always local host. And the port, if you followed my exact uh, same configuration, it should be also 3306. And for the user, it's root and the password within the precise. So just go ahead and click on test connection. Okay, so when you just provide the username and password, if you have a username and password, but if you didn't uh, provide a password, so just leave it empty. And when you click, you will see this succeeded means that you are able to connect to your database. Also one hint, be careful and make sure that you have your container running. So otherwise you will not be able to connect to the database. Okay, so I will click on OK. And now we see that we have our local host for MySQL. Let's configure our project to be able to connect to our database. And we will start with uh, connecting to PostgreSQL, but this is important because it's the same configuration and only few changes would be, um, would be different from MySQL or uh, PostgreSQL. So the first thing, just go to resources in here and here we have our application properties files. So I like or I prefer using YAML representation. So it's the same thing. The, the only or the main difference is just the way we write the properties. So I will use uh, YAML representation. If you want to use properties, it's also okay. So just go ahead, first of all, rename the application properties to application.yaml, okay? Next, now we will start providing information or providing properties to our application or to Spring container to be able to connect to the database. So first of all, our the first property will be Spring dot data source and then we need to provide the URL okay so uh, to be able to connect to a database, we need to provide a few information because we have the Spring Data JPA starter within our uh, dependencies. So uh, we need to provide the minimum required of information. Okay, so for that case, we need the URL. I will just come back to it uh, later. We need username. So in our, uh, no, not Hikari, just just username. So for our case, for PostgreSQL, we say we said that it's Postgres, and for the password, we why this Hikari, and for the password, we said uh, we want to use Alibu coding as password, uh, and then we need to provide also the driver class name. 
and the driver class name you see here that we have already two or three suggest we have three suggestions so the so the first one or the uh, the first one is for my sql or my sql the second one is for PostgreSQL sql because intellij is smart enough to detect that we have these dependencies in our pom.xml so it will suggest it okay so now what we need to what we need to do the first one we want to configure it for post degree SQL. So just choose the second option or the, or the first, I don't know the order that it will uh, pop up for you. And yeah, that's it. Now let's add some other configuration. Okay. Here I will add JPA and here I want to tell or to give some extra properties to spring configuration or to the spring data JPA on how to connect or how to manage or how or how to uh, work with my database okay and the first property is part of hibernate and it's called ddl auto this means what do we want to do when the application starts okay so we have many options the first one is create drop this means that we'll create and destroy the schema at the end of the execution or the life cycle of our application so when the application starts we will create the the schema and the tables and when we stop the application we will uh, we will drop or we will remove everything so be careful when choosing this one the second option is create so when when the application starts it will destroy all the previous data and recreate the schema from scratch so this is also you need to be careful about it we have also the non options mean that we want to disable the ddl handling that that this means that we don't want to do anything when the application starts uh last but not least the update option means that we want to update the schema if necessary so this means what this means that hibernate will compare the um, the java representation or the entities it will compare them to the table or the database schema that we have and it will try to to make it uh, even but here you need to put in mind something which is really important the update option it will not remove attributes so for example if you have an entity and you create uh, and you want to, to remove an, um, an attribute and replace it or like create other ones it will create the new attributes but it will not remove the existing ones okay so also you need to know that and you need to be careful about this the last option is validate this means what means validate this it will do it will not do any changes but it will just validate the schema comparing to the java representation or the entity representation so we have for example um, a user entity and we have a user table so the validate it will check if we have the same table same table name same attributes same attribute names same types and so on and so forth so it will just validate that what we have as code is the same as what we have within our database so for our configuration let's say create drop because this is um, a learning uh, course so we don't need to persist data forever so create drop should be fine for us so let's go with create drop and now we can also precise the database this like will help uh, spring or will help also hibernate to know which database we are dealing with so it will just enforce the way that we will uh, the way that we will uh, update and manage our database okay so here we have also the option uh, show sql let's set it to true because we want to see um, we want to see sql queries okay so now this is the main configuration or this is the configuration that we need to do now uh, we will need to go back to this url and the difference between for example configuring mysql and configuring postgresql is just providing the url the correct driver class name and here this option right here you can also change it to say it's mysql okay so now going back to this url so it's jdbc it's always like that jdbc dot 
PostgreSQL colon slash slash and then you need to provide the local host or like um, well whether it can be local host it's if it's locally or it can be an IP address or it can be a URL and so on and so forth so now we need to provide the port which is 5432 and then the database name as a reminder the database name we created here we called it data underscore JPA so here let's just provide it so now our application will be able to connect to this one so how to test it what we can do we can just go ahead and start the application and see if we are able to connect to the database now i will enable annotation processing because we have lombok within our application and as you can see here so the application already started in 2.9 seconds and without any issues so everything is up and because we don't have any tables so we don't have any further uh, information but if something is wrong we would see that we have exceptions in here and i will just show it to you so for example if i provide the wrong port name uh, number sorry <laughs> not name so if we provide the wrong port number uh, and we try to connect to the database we will see that we have a connection issue and it will say that enable to connect to this localhost uh, 5431 so connection refused and so on and so forth so this just to ensure you that when you have the correct configuration you will have no issues when connecting or when starting the application okay so now our application is ready to use let's move on we will add now the properties to connect to my sql database and to do that i highly recommend that if you skipped the the first part to connect or to configure uh, post degree sql i would really recommend that you go back because we explained all these parts so it's really really important that you that you go back and check that uh, now i would show you how to configure or how to connect to my sql the first thing let's go ahead and duplicate this application.yaml just copy and paste just command c command v also just as a reminder you every time i use a shortcut you can see the green uh, pop up uh, down here so yeah you can always follow what i'm doing so now i will just say my sql or just uh, the new file i will call it application dash my sql so this we can use it as a profile as a spring profile and i will show you how you can run the application whether for my sql or my sql or post degree sql so uh, how you can configure IntelliJ to run with a specific profile we will see it just in the end of this video okay just go ahead and click ok and let's start do the changes that we need okay let's put this in full screen or even i guess it's also like that is readable so uh, the first thing we need to of course change the username and password so for my sql it's root root and we will see if it works or not let's go ahead and change the driver and now we want to use the my sql driver okay and for the database we want also to use my my sql or my sql now we need to change or we need to update this url and connect to the database so uh, the good thing is within my sql you can ask him to create a database automatically if it doesn't exist or if the database does not exist so my sql will create it uh, sorry yeah so my sql will create it automatically for you the url is here instead of uh, let, let's remove it let's write it from scratch so it's jdbc and here my sql and then colon slash slash now we need to provide uh, the url of the database so it's localhost uh, colon 3306 this is the port that we want to use and then we want to use also the same database or the same database name here so just we 
just for to be uh, convenient so i will call it also data jpa okay and also you remember that that we did not create manually the database because as i mentioned uh, mysql has the um, the option or has the capability to automatically create a database if not exists so to do so just add interrogation mark and add this uh, parameter which called create database if not exists equals true and that's it so like that it automatically um, my sql will try to create or will create a database called data gpa if not exists okay now to run the application using this configuration first before clicking on this play button right here to run the, to run the application just click on jpa application and you will see edit configurations here and here you see that we have active profiles so spring now if i precise it as my sql spring what will do when starting the application he will try to find an application properties file or properties uh, file have uh, having the suffix my sql as precised in the configuration in here okay so here we said that the active profile we want it to be my sql we can we by the way we can provide many active profiles uh, uh, as you can see here it's profiles not profile so we can uh, provide many but in our case we want to connect to application dash my sql.yaml file so spring will automatically try to scan and read this file if exists okay i will click the run and let's see if the application is going to start correctly or not yes um all right so uh, we see here something that i didn't know uh, so here we see that loading class this one but it's deprecated and the new driver is the one that we saw in the options okay so we will just update it later on now i want to go and check the schema let's refresh this one and here we see that we have now five schemas and we see our database data jpa so we don't have nothing yet but this one once we create the table the tables and the entities we will have all the tables in here so uh, let's do the final update and let's replace this with a new driver using this package and that's it for this course, we will implement the following database class diagram. So uh, this database class diagram is about uh, e-learning platform and what it's about exactly. So it talks about um, how we can, for example, if you go to uh, Alibu coding and check the courses that I have there. So what you see, this is what we have behind the scenes so we have courses sections lectures and for each lecture we have uh, a resource and the course has an author and so on and so forth so this is what we will see but first let me explain to you uh, in depth this class diagram so uh, we have a course so for example this one that you are following right now which is mastering uh, spring data jpa uh, step by step so we have a course and this course has an author okay but a course can be done by many authors right and the same author can create many courses so for example me i can create so many courses and one course can be created uh, within a collaboration of multiple or many uh, authors okay so that's why here we have this many to many relationship but uh, here create uh, an author having an author within our database doesn't mean uh, that this author should already have a course within the database but if we have a course we should have at least one author assigned to that because when we want to create a course we need to assign it to 
at least one one author okay so that's why you see it this you see this symbol right here and you see this one right here means that the author is optional to have courses but a course is mandatory to be assigned or to be done or to be created by an author then uh, you know that a course has one or many sections okay so um, here when we create a course we need to create at least one section but we can have multiple sections for one, for one course and here just uh, put few uh, few attribute attributes just simple ones uh, like title description uh, name and order for the section and so on and so forth um, okay so uh, as I mentioned a course has one or many sections but one section if we take one section it belongs to one uh, one course and within the course we can have many sections that belong to that to that course okay all right next one when we talk about sections we have uh, many lectures okay we have so many one or many lectures and one lecture one lecture if we take one lecture it belongs to one section so this means that we cannot have one lecture that belongs or can figure out with in different sections okay so if we take the section a that has a uh, lecture one and lecture two so this lecture one it belongs only to this section a it can we cannot find it as part of uh, section c or section d for example okay now after that a lecture um, has a type or has a resource okay so a lecture has one resource and this resource belongs only to this one lecture so that's why here we have this one-to-one -one relationship between the lecture and the resource and for the resource we have of course the id name size and url and the resource can be of different types so i just created a simple uh, simple types here for example video file or text so this represents a resource okay so here what we have we have um, inheritance between this resource class or resource table and this video file and text objects okay so for the video we have the length for example for example how many minutes um, this video for the file we have the type for example whether if it's uh, pdf mp3 and so on so forth and we have the te for the text we have the content and all of them all these three types or three uh, types of resources they are already a resource and they can be assigned to a lecture okay so this is our class diagram and this is what we will implement during this course so we will go uh, through all this one by one and each time or uh, every time we need to explain something we will go ahead and create and see how we do that and also we will see how to create advanced search queries how to work with transactions and so on and so forth so you already saw the plan of the of the course and this is what we will be implementing before we go further let's first understand and explain the difference between hibernate and spring data jpa so first spring data jpa is just an abstraction layer on top of jpa to reduce the amount of boilerplate code required to implement data access objects or what we call dao or dao but jpa what is jpa jpa is just a specification that facilitates object relation mapping to manage relational data in java applications this means what we can consider jpa as uh, a java interface where we have or where we define the methods that we want 
to be that we want them to be implemented by any class that wants to use or implement this interface and why is that because we have so many implementations like for example we have hibernate we have eclipse link we have i Batis, and so on and so forth that all of them they should implement the jpa specification and the reason behind that is we want to make uh, coders or developers life much much easier so for example if you want to move from hibernate to eclipse link all you need to do is to do a minimum configuration or minimal changes like uh, ch changing the the dependency or maybe or maybe some basic configurations but for example if you have a save method it's the same it's exact the same method for hibernate uh, and uh, eclipse link for example this this is what jpa exactly as as i mentioned jpa is just the specification okay now if we go to the hibernate level so hibernate is a jpa implementation and also hibernate generates uh, sql query and executes using jdbc so hibernate is the orm the object relational mapping that will use jdbc to handle all the database side means like saving uh, reading deleting and so on and so forth okay so this is the main difference between hibernate and spring data jpa so let me also re-explain this part so instead of doing all the implementation and defining the, ses the session management and so the transaction management also and so on and so forth that uh, hibernate provides so spring data jpa will do all this job for us because as you know when using the spring data jpa starter it will auto configure almost everything for us so yeah this is the power of the spring data jpa let's see first how we can transform a table or a database table to a java class and to be able to manipulate it uh, within our application so let me explain this diagram right here so we have this author.java that we will take as a first example and we want to persist this object into our database and we want it to be stored directly into the author table okay so uh, we have our author.java that contains a set of attributes uh, id first name last name email and age and then what we will see next is which annotations that we need to use in order to make uh, spring data jpa understand that this is a table or this is an entity and needs to be persisted and so and so forth okay so uh, let's go to our IntelliJ now let's create within our base package com.alibucoding.jpa let's create a new class or um, yeah let's create a new class a java class in here but if you want for example if you don't have the right package uh, ready to use just uh, when you want to create the class you can precise the package uh, the package name for example if you want to call to call them models or if you want to call them entity or entities it's up to you so you, you just um, call uh, give them the package name for example let's say models in here and then you can precise the class the class name so for us it we want to create the author java class and we want it to be within the models package so when you hit enter so this is what we see in here and we have author created under the package models okay so now as we mentioned before let's just create our attributes so here just a reminder we want to create id of type integer first name last name and email of type string and we have an age of type int here i have a private integer id and i have a string first name
and they have also a last name private string email and finally I have a private int h so this is my Java class now what we need to do or like normally or usually what needs to be done when you create uh, a Java class or when you create especially when we talk about entities and so on and so forth. So always think about generating getters and setters. So make all the fields private and generate getters and setters. So to do so there is a shortcut uh, in here like as you can see like you can generate it uh, using this shortcut and here we have getter and setter. Here you can select all the fields that you want to generate getters and setters for and then just click OK and you will see that we have all these methods ready to use. But if you remember, we I will just roll back this. So if you remember, we already added Lombok to our uh, project or to our pom.xml. So let's use Lombok for that. OK, so the Lombok annotations, we have many annotations, many useful annotations. We have the getter annotation. And as you can see, it's always from the package Lombok. So this will generate uh, getters for this class. And also we want setters. So this will generate, this annotation will, will help us generate setters or setter methods for all the attributes in this class. If you want also, for example, a no args constructor, means a constructor with no parameters, you have the no args constructor annotation. Also, if you need uh, all args constructor, you can also add it using this annotation, also all args constructor. But we have another annotation, it's called data, always from uh, from Lombok and if we go and read the documentation always try to download uh, sources to be more readable for you and to get all the information that you need so here this data annotation it generates getters for all fields uh, useful to string method hash code uh, hash code and equals implementation and so on and so forth so this data annotation it's the equivalent to getter setter required args constructor to string and equals and hash code annotation. So always to reduce the amount of boilerplate code, we can remove this and we can remove this too. So we can just work with two annotations, data and no args constructor and also if you need other annotations it's also e easy to use so we have now our uh, our class or our java object ready to use let's move on and try to make this an entity or to make it a table now let's try to answer one question is having a java class containing all the attributes that we need for our table is it enough to tell Spring that this is an entity? So Spring or Spring Data JPA, how he will know that this is an entity and needs to be managed? So the answer, first of all, the answer, this is not enough. Having just a Java class is not enough. And we need to tell Spring that this is an entity. So we need to provide an, some annotations or some, uh, some information in order for Spring to be able to scan and pick up this object. So I already told you the answer. So we need to give an annotation and this annotation is entity, okay? So this entity, just let me show it to you first. So now we are using Spring Boot 3.0 and as you know, one of the uh, breaking changes or like the biggest changes is using Jakarta EE 9 and we, when we use Jakarta EE so we, the package is no longer javax.persistence so all the javax not all of them 100% but 
all the Java X packages that uh, belongs to the Jakarta EE. Now they re they have been renamed to Jakarta. Okay, and from now on we need to use Jakarta dot persistence for all these annotations. Okay, uh, all right. So here. Uh, using this annotation and when we run the application automatically hibernate spring and spring data jpa like all of them are working together so they will be able to pick and tell this is an entity so we, we need to use it okay and i want to show you also the documentation and it says that this specifies that the class is an entity so it specifies that the class that has this annotation is an entity, okay? And also this is so important, this annotation is applied to the entity class. So here it's um, it's a type, type level or type target. So like this, we covered this part, this entity part, and we have here the same package as we already saw together. So now Spring will be able to know or to recognize this author.java class as an entity. Let's move on and see what we need to provide as minimum information in order to have this entity created in our database. After annotating this Java class, this author Java class with the entity, so this means that Spring Data JPA will recognize this class as an entity and it will create the table, for example, based on the configuration we specified in the DDL auto when we first configured the application. So it will automatically create this table. Otherwise, it will consider it as a table. All right. But here we see that we still have an issue. Even by having this entity annotation, we still see that we have some error right here. And let's go ahead and check it together. So here it says that the persistent entity author, so we see that now our class is a persistent entity, should have a primary key. So you may ask the question, I already have a key field right here. But yes, this is a key for us. We are a human being and we understand and we can read that this field is ID and even our intention is to have it as an ID for our entity. But Spring Data JPA doesn't understand this. Spring Data, Data JPA is just a program. It's just a zero and one is a binary. So it understands only annotations. Okay. So to make this field an ID or any other field an ID, we need to add an annotation. And this annotation is as the name says. So it's the annotation ID. And here, while we are using the Spring 3.0, always make sure that you are using the annotation from the correct package. Okay. So the package is always jakarta.persistence. All right. I will insert this one and we see that the error now is gone. But first let me explain to you what is this ID. So in Spring Data JPA, the ID annotation is used to mark a field as the primary key of an entity. It is used to specify the identifier property of an entity, which is used to uniquely identify an instance of the entity in the database. Okay, so when the entity is persisted to the database, the value of this field will be used as a primary key of the corresponding database table. So this means the value of this integer ID is unique within our table and also it might be unique within our database depends on the generation type or the strategy that we will use to generate this ID. All right. So here I want also to answer one small question you might ask. So why we are using integer here instead of instead of int? Okay. So the answer is as follow. So the int value by default is zero but the integer value by default is null and this is super important because spring data jpa and when we talk and we talk mainly here about hibernate because we are using the hibernate implementation 
So uh, hibernate each time when we try to save or to persist a new row or new line into our table. Hibernate will check the value of this ID or the field annotated with the ID. If the value is null, Hibernate will understand that we want to create or to persist a new element in the, into the database. Otherwise, if the value is different from null or is not null, he will try to fetch the element within the table that has this value, okay? So if we use the int, if we use the primitive type, so the default value will be zero. So Hibernate will try to find an element or a row with the value zero and it, it will never find it, okay? So that's why it's always recommended to use wrappers over primitive types. Okay, so um, I hope this is clear. If you have any questions, just go ahead, reach out to me. Otherwise, let's move on. We already explained that this ID is the unique identifier of, of our table. And we mentioned that we want to use or we need to use the wrapper classes or the classes like objects in here because the integer is the wrapper class of the primitive type int. Because when Hibernate sees that uh, this ID has a null value, it will automatically uh, generate a new ID and insert a new line into our table. But how Hibernate will generate this ID? So here we talk about genera generation types or generated values for our IDs. And here let's explain or let's see which annotation or which mechanism can help us generate this ID. All right, so the answer is easy. And here we have an annotation called generated value. And just a reminder, always from jakarta.persistence. And once we mention or once we annotate a field with this generated value, here, let's check the documentation, what is written in here. So it says that it provides for the specification of generation strategies of for the values of primary keys. So here, this is a keyword, means that we work with primary keys. So this generated value works with primary keys. So the generated value annotation may be applied to a primary key property or field of an entity or mapped superclass in conjunction with the ID annotation. So this property or this annotation might work with primary key a property of a field or an entity or map superclass. We will see all these uh, terms together and always in conjunction with the ID annotation. The use of the generated value annotation is only required to be supported for simple primary keys. So we cannot use this generated value with complex uh, keys. Means complex keys means we can have, for example, uh, an ID composed of two fields, let's say, for example, an integer and a date. So this we can create a composed key. And, and we will see that also uh, somewhere like after in the in this course. OK, so uh, use the generated use of the generated value annotation is not supported for derivative primary keys. OK, so um, here we have this annotation generated value and we know that it will generate uh, it will generate an ID or auto generate a value for us. Let's check what we have in here or what which properties we have within this annotation. So we have a strategy which is of generation type and also we have a generator. So this strategy is the primary key so it's optional but it's the primary key generation strategy that the persistence provider must use to generate the annotated entity primary key so here it we we can define or we need to define what which strategy we want to use so the persistence provider and the persistence provider here means the database provider or the database management system we are using must use to generate the annotated entity primary key. So here we have a default value for this and we will check what are the types we have right here. The second one 
it's also optional we don't need to specify this property and this is the name of the primary key generator to use and specifies the sequence ge sequence generator or the table generator annotation defaults to the id generator supplied by persistence provider so here based on the on the generation type that we want to use we can also create our own generator so this means what let's go ahead first and check these generation types so for these generation types we will go and understand them one by one we have table sequence identity and we have this uui id and this auto okay all right so we will understand this in a few seconds and now i want to go back to this generated value annotation and talk about this generator so we saw that within this generation type we saw that we have one value called table and one value called sequence so this sequence generator and table generator they are responsible if we want to create manually our sequence generator or table generator so we will understand that in the sec in the next lecture So now let's understand the different types of these generation strategies. So as we mentioned, the default value of this generated value, the strategy, the default value of it is the auto, and we also have the sequence table and identity. So first let's understand what this strategy equals auto means. So this means that Hibernate will try to connect to the database or to the persistence provider and try to determine which is the best strategy to use. So to understand this more in practice, so just a reminder, here we see that you have within this, this uh, generated value annotation, we have the default strategy is auto. And now in order to understand that, all we need to do is to start our application. So by default, our application is connected to PostgreSQL and we will see that within PostgreSQL, it will choose one strategy, but when we choose uh, MySQL or we start with the MySQL uh, profile, it will choose a different one. Okay, so let's go ahead and start our application. So our application has started and we let's check the log first and then we will check the database so here it's just a normal log and a classic one but we see here we have some hibernate logs so now what we have we have create sequence author sequence start with one increment by 50 okay and then we create a table author with the following uh, attributes integer id not null and so and so forth and we have here or we are defining here a primary key id okay so this is good let me reduce this and here within this uh, data jpa or our database let's refresh it and here if you see zero of three you need to select the public schema okay now let's open this one within the public we see that we have one table which is our author table right here with the fields or the columns that we defined which is uh, id age email first name and last name and also we see that we have one sequence which is the author sequence so by default hibernate determined that the best strategy to generate ids for this uh, database for the post degree sql database is using sequence so it created a sequence and it named it author sequence by default like it, it takes the concatenation of the table name within a suffix underscore sequence and then it using it will use this sequence to generate values so if we have multiple tables or like more than one entity the sequence name will be hibernate sequence okay but for now we have on one single table so it will take the table name with this sequence suffix all right now let's restart our application but using the mysql profile and let's see what will happen within this mysql okay so let's do it 
and in order to profile uh, in order to define the different profile so all we need to do here with an IntelliJ you see this uh, little carrot right here just click on it and then open edit configurations select your application right here so you might have multiple ones but select the one JPA application it's the, our application name and here specify the profile name and the profile name how you can find it let me close this one first and you open here and you see for um, here for our application it, it's called application dash mysql so this mysql is the profile name so now let's go ahead edit the configuration and in the active profiles right here i will just provide my sql so like that when we start up the application spring will pick up this configuration file so now the application is running and we see that uh, we have drop table if exist drop table if exist and here what do we have here we are creating first create table author with the with the attributes or the ids that we precised and we see here instead of creating a sequence we have create table author sequence so it contains a next value attribute of type big int okay so here my sql and hibernate determined that the best strategy for my sql is uh, using table okay using strategy table and this might not be the best strategy but maybe my sql or any other database management system does not support one or another strategy for example my sql does not support sequences so it will fall back to the second option maybe i don't know the exact order but i'm just trying to explain it like that so it will fall to the next strategy which is author uh, which is table strategy okay so let's check our tables right now click here refresh and now we see that we have two tables. The one is our author with the five columns that we already precised and the author sequence is only one column which is the next value. So if I open this table, you see that for now it contains only one line and the value is one. And if I insert any data, it will automatically increase it by one and use it for the next value. All right, so this is the auto strategy. And now let's move on and talk about the next one. So here we saw together how Hibernate is able to detect which strategy is the best for our persistence provider. Now let's talk a bit more into in details about this sequence generation. Okay, so by default, Hibernate will create a sequence if possible of course but let's assume that we are using PostgreSQL and the best strategy is sequence so hibernate will automatically create a sequence but what if we don't have the right to create sequences what if we have a database admin that creates everything for us so we need or we need to specify which sequence we have already or like we need to point hibernate to that sequence and the name might be different one might be a different sequence so we need to point hibernate to that so this is one use case the second use case i want to create my own the sequence and i want also to auto generate or to auto configure manually the allocation size so we saw in the previous uh, lecture that hibernate will use the value 50 as an incrementation or an, uh, as a step value so we want for example to be one all right so let's see how we can do this so now in order to do that first of all we need to specify the strategy right here and the strategy if you hit control space we see the, th the options that we have and let's choose sequence okay now i just want to remind you that within this generated value annotation we have the strategy and the generator and the generator here it's the name of the primary key generator all right so let's give it right here i will just put it into new lines and here i will precise the generator 
and my generator is a string like we should we need to give it uh, a string name and I will call it author generator or sequence author sequence okay I will call it author sequence or seek like let's call it sequence to to see the difference between the one we generated before or that was automatically generated I'm talking about this one so our name would be author sequence all right okay so now we have author sequence but when we start the application hibernate will will not find this author sequence so it will claim or it will raise an exception telling that we don't find this exception all right so what we need to do is we need to create or to manually create this sequence okay and to do that it's really easy peasy we have an annotation called sequence generator and this annotation sequence generator it takes a name as a parameter so this is uh, the name and the name should be the same like as this one all right so i'm just gonna copy paste it to avoid uh, typos and let me align it so after providing the name we need also to specify the sequence name the sequence name is the sequence that also we want to use as a name all right so sequence name by default it's empty but let's also use this author sequence as a name next we talked about uh, allocation size means the step of increasing or incrementing this sequence and it's called allocation size and as you can see here the default value of this one is 50 and this is what we saw before in the logs that's this is where this allocation size or 50 is coming from all right so for us we want an allocation size of one and now that's it we have our sequence generator and we have our generated value for this id let's go ahead start the application and see what will happen so here we see that we have this log right here uh, create sequence author sequence so now it's called author sequence start with one increment by one so it starts from the position number one and it's incremented by one and this start by one so it's from the initial value so you can also change it if you want to start your sequence from specific value all right next we are creating the table and now let's go and check the database and make sure that we have everything in order so i will just refresh this one and we see that we have our table and now our sequence is called author sequence so in case you want to create a, sp uh, a specific sequence or um yeah a specific sequence for each entity this is the way how to do it all right so now this is how sequences works and then you don't need to do anything hibernate will automatically use this author sequence to generate the id all right so that's it if you have any questions just reach out to me on contact at alibucoding.com or you know all my contacts on social media otherwise let's move on now what if we want to choose a different strategy of generation what if we want to use table instead of sequence and we want to create our or table generator instead of sequence generator so let me show you how to do that first of all i will just comment out this sequence generator i will let it i will leave it here in the code so you can use it then we need to change this generation type from sequence to table and I will call or rename this generation or generator instead of author sequence, I will call it uh, author ID generator, generator, okay? So ID gen, I will call it like that, okay? Now, uh, instead of using this sequence generator, we have a similar annotation, which is table generator, okay? This table generator, it takes a name as parameter so the name i don't need to mention it again but it should be the same name as in here after precising the name i want to precise also the table right 
So the table right here, let's call it ID generator, for example. All right, next we need to precise the primary column name, comma here, PK column name, and this is gonna hold the column name of our primary key. Let's call it um, ID name, for example, just to make it uh, easy for you. I will call it ID name and the value and the value column name is the value for this column. So I will call it ID value, just to be consistent with that and make it easy for you. And of course, we can define the allocation size. As you can see here, it's always default 50, and I want to make it one. All right, so I will keep the same profile, the, um, the PostgreSQL profile, so we can see the difference or we can see what will happen when I restart the application. So I'm gonna stop it right now and restart it. So here, let's first check what we have as information. So we have here create table author. So this is our main table. And then we are creating a table called IG ID generator and the ID name is type of var chart 255, 255 and ID value and so and so forth. So here, what we are doing, insert into ID generator, and we are inserting the first value, which is the author, and the, and the value is zero, all right? So let's check what we have in here. I'm gonna refresh this one. Let me... So here we no longer see this sequence generator right here. We no longer have the sequence, but instead we have this generator table and this generator table it contains only uh, already one line which is the author which is our entity name and the id value is zero so when we use this table generator the one that we created manually it will create one line for each entity and it will initialize the id value for it so if we want to insert another entity it will come here, query it by the name, and you, as you can see, the name is, is an ID, so it should be unique, and it will increment the value for that one. So this is how we can also use tables as uh, generators, but here, before we finish this part, I want just to bring everything as it was before. So I will also comment this out, just to leave it in the code like that and also I will change or just remove this okay so I will just leave it as generation type auto and like that I don't need to care about uh, which strategy to use all right so that's it if you have any questions don't forget to reach out to me otherwise let's go ahead and continue In the background, I restarted the application, so we have the previous state, so now we have our table and we are using the sequence as a generator. So what we what I want to show you in this part is, as you can see here, we have this ID, age, email, first name, last name, and so on and so forth. But the question is, what if I want to have more control over these columns? Okay, so for example, this first name, I want to have a different name and I want to have a different name for this last name. I want something which is different from the field that I have right here. So this is the first thing. The second, I want to have uh, a unique or I want to make sure that my email is unique. So uh, this would prevent me from having duplications uh, when we talk about email because we know that an email is unique per, per user. All right, so to do so, we have an annotation that can help us um, reach this goal. So let me make this one full screen. And first of all, let's talk about this annotation. So the annotation is colon. And first, let's check what this colon is, what this annotation. So it specifies the mapped colon of a persistence property or field. If no colon, this is so important, if no colon annotation is specified, the value or the default value apply. So default value means what? Means the default values of this annotation, of this colon annotation. 
and let's quickly check the attributes that we have right here so as you can see all of them are optional here so the first one we have this name so this is the name of the column otherwise it will take the property of the field name so if we don't precise anything in here so the default name will be first name and here as you can see that uh, when we write it in camel case it will be transformed automatically into snake case all right now let's go back to this colon annotation we have a unique attribute so this specifies whether the colon is unique or not uh, also if it's nullable if we accept null values by default it's true but if we accept null values or not and here we have this insertable uh, property so this means what this means that if we accept the that we can insert new value for this column you may ask the question why i should prevent inserting and the answer is when we talk about for example dates and we have an update date or the last modified date of this column so here we want we don't want it to be insertable but we want it to be only updatable okay so here we have insertable true updatable true and the same the same for this updatable property so for creation date or like the the date of creation of a new line or when we insert a new row into a table we want to track the creation date so the creation date should be only insertable and we need to insert it only when we when we create a new line but when we update the same line we don't want to update it so this field should not be updatable okay and here we have a table we have length and also length for example for strings we can specify or we can say for example that um, a username or a login name or uh, a pseudonym uh, should be only maximum or have the length of eight uh, eight characters maximum okay and when it comes also to uh, numeric numbers or decimals we can talk also about precisions and scale so okay now we we talked enough let's go and see this in action all right so the for the first name i want to have uh, my name or the name of this field to be like that for example f name all right and why we have or why we we need to change this so like um, for projects from scratch it's it's okay because we will define everything but imagine you want to work on on a project where the database already exists and for example let's take the financial um, domain and the database already exists but um, believe me you don't want to know how they call the fields or the columns so it's totally totally different because they are using really technical names uh, financial technical names so we want to have a more understandable for our java application we need to have a more understandable names so we need to stick to the same names to the database but we want to have our own all right so when we manipulate objects within our uh, java pro java project we want to use first name instead of this f name or it can be f1234 so we don't want to name our field f1234 we want to name it first name and then we can reference it or we can give it a name that will be used within our database okay so this is the first one now i will move on to this email so for the email for example it's okay it's fine for me to keep the name as it is but for this email i want for example to i want it to be unique so as you can see and also as i showed you before this unique attribute has a default value false so by default the field or the colon is not unique but let's make it unique so when we use this property this means that the email will become unique so we cannot insert a duplicate values for this email all right also i can make it non-nullable because also nullable by default is false but i want to specify or like make the user uh, 
pass a value for this email so the email I want I don't want to see any emails into my database with null values okay also if you want to I, I know this is um, this is not okay but let's go back and do it in here I was going to talk about the length if I want to have a specific length so the default is 255 and let's say for example I want to have uh, 35 as max length for this first name so this is the property to use all right so here if we talk for example as we mentioned before I will create a local date time field right here uh, created at so this is the creation date and I will give it also the colon annotation right and for this colon annotation I want this to be not updatable all right so as you can see it's by default true but I don't want this field or this column to be updated so I want it only to be insertable so I don't need to specify the insertable because by default it's true but I don't want this one to be updatable and this one cannot be null all right so this also nullable false now I will create another colon and I will call it last updated at or last updated or last modified let's call it like that so for this last modified I will also use the colon annotation and within this colon annotation I want this one to not to be insertable so I don't want to insert this last modified when I first created when I first create a new line or if, when I first insert a new line I want this last modified to be null so because if I insert it it might be confusing because mm, for example I want to query all the data where the other data that were not modified okay so I don't want to insert it all right uh, I want it also to be updatable and it will be nullable so I just keep the default value because nullable is by default true so using this colon annotation we can have more control over our columns within the within our entity and on the database level so we can precise the name we can precise the length we can also um, check the unicity and the nullability of, of our field also we can decide if it's updatable or not and if it's insertable or, or not so this annotation gives us more more and more control over our uh, our columns okay so I'm gonna restart the application and let's see the impact of these uh, of these annotations right here so let's see what what was the impact of this so um, here so it's here it's just updating the constraint so here we see that first of all we are we are adding a, cons a new constraint to our email with this unique so now it's unique and here for example for the age uh, it's an integer not null and we have this created at it's not null the email is also this the same and we see that the first name is now called f name and and is no longer called first name all right so we see also that the last modified is a timestamp but we don't have any control over it like a uh, not null and so and so forth same for the last name and here we are def defining the primary key as our ID colon let's see the changes directly visually I will refresh this and now we have our seven columns so we see here that we have this ID the age created at email and we see this small circle right here so this means that these objects are not null or so they should not be null okay also we see that we have two keys so we have the author primary key and we have a second one which is referencing the email because we don't want this email to be null and we want it to be unique so here you see this UK is unique stands for unique key PK stands for primary key all right so I hope this was clear for you otherwise drop me a message and let's move on 
Now let's take the following example. What if we want our table to be named author underscore TBL as a table name in the database and we have our Java class called author. So in this case, how we can map or how we can tell this entity or the Java class or we mainly talking about Spring Data, JPA and Hibernate, how we can tell Hibernate to name this entity and give it the name author underscore TBL in the database. So the answer is in here, we see this annotation. This, the table annotation is the one that can help us do this. So let's see the power of this annotation. So let's go back to the code right here. And now I will use this table annotation right here. So first of all, let's check what are the properties of, of this annotation. So first of all, uh, it says that it specifies the primary table of uh, for the annotated entity. Additional tables may be specified using secondary table and secondary tables. So here, if no table annotation is specified for an entity class, so the default values apply. So if we don't use this annotation, we will apply this default value. So the name will be empty, catalog, and so on and so forth. So let's now discover quickly this, these fields or these properties. So name, this is the name of the table. So we already have the answer how we can change or how we can give a specific table name. Here we can also specify a catalog and the same for the schema. So for example, if my table is located in a different schema, so I can provide it in here. So I can give this information. So for example, if I have a schema one, schema two and schema three within the same, uh, within the same database. So uh, I can spe specify or I can precise which schema for each entity or each table. Also, if I have unique constraints, like the one we did before, we want, uh, for example, our email to be unique. We want, we want to add uh, new indexes and so on and so forth. So we can add a list or a table of unique constraints. Okay. The same for indexes. All right. Let's go back here. So for our case, we only want or we only need to give uh, to give a name to our table because the, we have only one schema. So if you have a different one, you can give also the schema name. So here I will call it author TBL and I will restart the application and let's see the changes. So click on restart right here. And let's check again what we have. So we have this sequence, this author TBL underscore sequence, and we have our table now is called author TBL. Okay. So just for record, uh, databases are not case sensitive, just in case you don't know this information. So that's why we see here that the table is written is lowercase and here it's already in uh, uppercase. So we see, we see now that the table or the table name has changed and now it's called author TBL. All right. So yeah, that's it. I will just clean up the code, make comment out this annotation and I will leave the rest for you. So thank you so much. Um, drop me a message if you have any questions. Otherwise, let's move on. So far, we learned how to manipulate the tables, how to create entities, which are the annotations that we need to use, which properties of these annotations we can use. Like, for example, when we talk about uh, generated values how and the strategies, how they work, how we can also customize them and create our own uh, and private sequence and table, uh, table generator and so and so forth. But now we didn't reach yet the point where we need to discuss or when, where we need to manipulate and interact directly with the database. Interact means, for example, crude operations like read, uh, create, read, update, and delete. And this we will see right here. For example, we have as always our author table in the database. So this author table has its own representation in our Java code as an author.java. 
and we need to persist this object to this database. So the link between the author and the database right here because the data, a table already belongs to a database. But when we talk about Java program and programs and also when we talk about Spring Boot Framework, we talk about uh, entities, all right? So um, what we need to do to in order to better interact with this database. So here comes the power of Spring Data JPA. So Spring Data JPA uh, made it so easy for us because he proposed something really, really nice, which is a repository. And the repository is an abstraction to reduce the amount of boilerplate code needed to implement the DAO layer or the data access object to interact with the data stores. Okay, so let's go a bit deeper within this definition. So in Spring Data JPA, a repository is a Java interface that is used to abstract the data access layer from the business logic. It is used to perform CRUD operations. CRUD, just a reminder, stands for create, read, update, and delete, as well as other common database operations, such as pagination and sorting. Repositories are typically defined as interfaces and uh, that extend one of the Spring Data JPA repository interfaces such as uh, JPA repositories, CRUD repository, paging and sorting repositories. So these are the three main uh, repositories or JPA repositories that we can extend, like we create an interface and extend this interface to, to have our own repository, okay? So because these interfaces provide a number of predefined methods that can be used to perform common database operations such as uh, saving, deleting entities, finding entities by their primary keys, finding entities based on various criteria. And this is what we will see in details later on, okay? But first, let's understand and see this hierarchy of repositories. So far, we learned how to create a Java class out of a database table. And this Java class is the representation of the table in our database. Now we have another question is what can we do or how can we do when it comes to database manipulation and interacting with the database? Means if I want to persist a new object into or a new row into this author table, so how can I do this? So the answer is using JPA repositories. Right, so, but first let's understand and give a quick definition of this repository. So a repository is an abstraction to reduce the amount of boilerplate code needed to implement the DAO layer or the data access object to interact with the data stores. Indeed, in Spring Data JPA, a repository is a Java interface that is used to abstract the data access layer from the business logic. It is used to perform CRUD operations such as create, read, update, and delete. So this is what CRUD stands for. Uh, like uh, And then as well as other common database operations such as paging and sorting. So repositories are typically defined as interfaces that extend one of the Spring Data JPA repository interfaces, such as CRUD repository, paging and sorting repository, or JPA repository. So this has been a bit changed since uh, Spring 3.0, and I will show you the difference right now. So these interfaces provide a number of predefined methods that can used to perform common database operations, such as saving and deleting entities, finding entities by their primary keys, finding entities based on various criteria, and so and so forth. And we will see in deep how we can create data or can create queries using the Spring Data JPA repositories. So, but first let's understand or see the hierarchy of the Spring Data JPA repositories. 
So as we can see here, that's why I told you before that it was slightly uh, changed about when we talk about paging and sorting repositories, because now the new architecture looks like that. So we start, as we mentioned, by creating an interface. So for our, for our example, we want to create an author repository. And then we need to extend one of these five repositories that we see right here, all right? But let's start and see the uh, inheritance from the lower level, from the lowest level to the, uh, from the highest level to the lowest one. Actually, it's the, the other way around. So we first can start by extending JPA repository right here. And this JPA interface uh, repository, it also extends two other interfaces at the same time. So it extends the list paging and sorting repository and list crude repository. So this list crude and list paging, so both of them, they contain methods, like that's that. this is where comes the difference because there have been a small refactoring in these interfaces. So now we have all the methods that returns list they are within this list paging and sorting repository. So this in order also to, to reduce more the, uh, the boilerplate code, because for example, if I want only to perform crude operations with I don't need list, so I can only extend this crude repository. Same for paging and sorting, but if I want everything, all I need to do is extending this JPA repository. So let's continue. So here we see, or we said that uh, the JPA repository extends at the same time list crude repository and list paging and sorting repository. And the list crude repository already extends crude repository. And this crude repository also extends the basic uh, interface, which called repository. It's the same way when we, when we take the left-hand side uh, part. So when we talk about JPA extending list paging and sorting repository, this interface itself, it also extends the paging and sorting repository. So now let's go ahead and see the code or the implement, well, not the implementation, but the interface, which was created by Spring Data JPA. So go back to your IntelliJ, hit Command Shift O or Control Shift plus N for Windows and Linux users, and just type JPA repository. And you will see that we can open the Java class or the repository if you already downloaded the code and we can open it and it's the one spring data jpa the version 3.0.0 so if you are using a previous version of spring boot this might be slightly different okay but our course is fully focusing on spring 3.0 because we want to see the new changes and we want to use also the most recent versions all right, let's go back in here. So we see that we have here our JPA repository interface, which is extending at the same time list crude repository and list paging and sorting repository. So this query by example executor, so this is something else we will see uh, later on. So that's why I didn't mention it in the, um, in the, in this, uh, in the diagram. So let's go back and focus on this. So here we have this list crude repository. If we open it, we see that this list crude repository is already extending the crude repository and list crude repository contains all the listing methods. So save all, find all, find all by ID. And then when we open this crude repository, we see that it also extends the repository interface and this crude repository contains uh, these methods like the crude method, save, save all, find, find by ID and so and so forth. All right. And the same way, if we want to go to list paging and sorting. So here we have this find all within this list paging and sorting repository. The same when we go to the paging and sorting repository interface, we see that we have this find all, find all and so and so forth. And this one, like we see when we talk, because when we talk about paging and sorting, we mainly talk about lists. 
So we have here the first parameter for the find all is a sort and the second one it's a pageable and the pageable also contains the sorting so we can when we if we want, we want to use this one so it already covers this. All right, but make sure that the return type of this one is iterable and this one is page. So this is just to mention. And as we said, both of them, they extend the repository interface. All right, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on and continue. First of all, we will create a repository for this author model or this author entity. But first of all, don't panic if you see that I removed the code and don't worry, you will not be losing the code because here it's just a cleanup and you can find all the code when you go to Git right here and then you click on the logs. You will see that after each chapter, I will commit or have a full commit right here. So if you double click on this author, you will see all that you all you need. So here you have the entity, you have all the annotations, the strategies and so and so forth. So you will see all the changes that we will do in each chapter. So don't panic. Don't worry about, about that. So it's just for me to have a clean code for each step. All right, so now in order to create a repository, it's so easy. So here I will create a new package or I can create a class and a package at the, at the same time. So here create a package, call it repositories and then dot and the class name or the repository name. And don't forget to select interface because we mentioned that a repository is an interface that extends another interface, one of the JPA repository interfaces. So uh, let's call it author repository. Hit enter. So here we see that we have a public interface author repository. And in order to transform or to tell Spring that this is a JPA repository, we need to extend one of the J uh, one of the repositories. Okay, the repository interfaces. So for our case, we will extend the JPA repository. So because within JPA repository, we have all the methods. And as we saw before, this JPA repository, it's a generic interface that takes two types. The first one is T, which is the class or the table. And the second one is the ID. And this is the unique ID or the type of our ID within our entity. All right. So if here it's integer, so we will pass integer. If you use string, long, uh, big decimal and so on and so forth, just pass that type. All right. So let's finish this one. So it's a repository or JPA repository of our object author. So this will help uh, Spring Data GPA to determine and correctly write the correct queries. OK. And of course, we, we want our ID, which is of type integer. OK, so like this, we have our first repository. Now let's go ahead and play a little bit with this repository and create or insert some data and see how we can use this repository. Now, in order to test this repository right here, we need to create a service and then create a controller, expose the endpoint and use Postman or like use Swagger UI to test this uh, repository or test these methods and so and so forth. So the process might be a bit long, but let me show you a better way how to do it. OK, so we will use a command line runner and the command line runner is uh, a bean or is a method that will be executed at the application startup. OK, so when we first start the application, we will run this method. And within this method, we can inject any bean which is available within our application context. All right. So to do so, let me close all this. Go to the JPA application or your main application file, the one where you have the Spring Boot application, because this is the startup class. And then just create a bean. All right. So add the bean annotation and here a public beans always uh, should always be public. Don't forget that. And the type is command line runner. 
All right, so this interface right here, command line runner, give it a name, command line runner, and within this command line runner uh, method or bean, you can pass any type you want right here, okay? So it's like that, and now I want to inject my author repository right here, okay? So I will create an object of type author repository, I will call it repository as a simple name. So like this, automatically this bean or this author repository will be injected, okay? So now to implement this, let's use a Lambda expression. So let's say return args or something like that, and then arrow function, and that's it. And inside this method, we can implement or we can do whatever we want within this repository, okay? So let's go back, check quickly our author method. So here we have the data, no args constructor, entity, and so on and so forth. I will just add two annotations. The first one is all args constructor to have a constructor with all the arguments. And the other one is the builder annotation. So the builder annotation, it's for uh, the design pattern builder, which help us create and building objects. So I will show it to you right away. So now to use this builder uh, annotation or this builder design pattern, I will create a var, call it author. So you can use var because we are uh, using Java 19. So equals author dot builder dot build. So you see, because we have this author, because we have this builder annotation, now we can use this build or builder method. So you see already in the icon right here, this is the Lombok icon. And yeah, so, and then I will just type build. All right, so uh, this builder help us, like we can use the field names as, as methods. So first name, email, and so on and so forth to create or to instantiate an object, all right? So uh, let's have first name. I will call it Alibu, last name also Alibu. Let me make this one full screen. Uh, age, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my age. I'm getting a bit old. Okay, so email, here you can find my email if you want to contact me. So it's contact at alibucoding.com and that's it. So these are the information that we need to create an author object. Now let's use our repository dot save, right? So within the repository, let's go ahead and have a quick look on the methods that we have right here. So we have save, count, count, delete, equals, uh, delete all, delete all by ID. So all these methods, they come from all the interfaces that we saw together. So like we have a pre-built methods that we can use without any need to create uh, methods our own, like or to type or, or create queries manually. So we can use Spring Data JPA or the repositories to create a bunch of methods or many methods that uh, can make our life so easy. So for now, I want just to test the save method. So I want to save this author object, okay? So at the application startup, when I run the application, this bean will get executed and, and it will insert a data or a line into the database, okay? So uh, let's start the application and test this one. All right, so the application is running right now and let's first check the logs. We see that we have a first log from Hibernate, which is select next val from author seek, or like this is the sequence. So Hibernate will get the sequence or the next value from our author sequence. And then we see that we have an insert into author age, email, and so on and so forth. And here we have the values. So here it's like just a interrogation mark because 
uh, it will not print out the, the execution, but here it's logging already that you are inserting something into the database. Now let's open our database and check that we have our data. So I will open this author table. Uh, first, let me refresh because we renamed a few staffs. Yeah, now we have our author table. Go ahead, open it, and we can see right here that we have this ID, we have the age, email, and so and so forth. So here, like the, the object, he got executed, this bean got executed, and now we see that we have some data within uh, our database. So also, this might be useful for you if you need to execute something at the application startup you can use this command line runner so we will be using it uh, in the future maybe to uh, to test a few things all right so yeah that's it let's move on now and answer one small question at the application startup when we execute this block of code or when we execute any kind of this code in service or in a controller or whatever. So I mean when we create an object and we try to make a transaction to our database, saving it, deleting it, reading and so and so forth. So we call this a transaction, but this is not the main um, goal of this part. But first of all, we want to understand what is the life cycle of an entity okay and to understand this let's go ahead and open this diagram right here in order to understand what is a life cycle okay so in hibernate an entity is an object that is persisted to a database table and the life cycle of an entity refers to the entity to the different states that it can be in during its existings, from when it's first created until it's eventually removed from the database. All right, so let's go and check these four states of a hibernate entity, okay? So the first one here, we have the first state, which is the, f the state transient. And this is the state of an entity when it has just been instantiated and is not associated with, hib with a hibernate session. An entity in this state is not persisted to be the database and is not managed by hibernate. This means what? Means when we have or we create a new instance of our author object or we use the builder for that. So we move from the object to a transient object right here. So at this level, our object is still transient. It's not persisted and it's not yet managed by hibernate. But once we execute one of the following methods, save, persist, save or update or update. So like this, we will move from the transient state to the persistent state. So the entity or this object will become a hibernate managed object. All right. All right, let's talk about and explain this persistent state. So this is the state of an entity when it's associated with a Hibernate session and is being managed by Hibernate. An entity in this state is persisted to the database and any changes made to its properties will be persisted to the database when the transaction is committed. So here, when we do or we, when we operate any kind of this operations right here, so the state will become persistent and any updates. So if we made any, if we make any updates to this author object and we execute one of them, so this change will be affected or applied to the database once the transaction is committed. All right. So now after this trend, after this persistent state, we can move whether to the removed state or to the detached one. Let's talk about the detached state first. So to detach an entity, the detach is this state of an entity is when it was previously associated with a hibernate session, but is no longer associated with it. All right. 
and uh, an entity in this state is persisted to the database but is not being managed by Hibernate. Any changes made to, uh, to its property will not be persisted to the database until the entity is reattached to a Hibernate session. So let's focus on this until the entity is reattached to a Hibernate session. session. So this means what? Once we execute one of the following methods, detach, close, clear, or evict, the state of the Hibernate entity will pass from persistent to detached. Okay, and here when the entity is detached, we have two choices. So the first one, we can go back to the persistent state or we can just go to the garbage this object will just move to the garbage right here, okay? But let's first talk about this uh, word that we said until the entity is reattached to the Hibernate session. To reattach the entity to the Hibernate session, we can use one of the following methods. Save, save or update, merge, merge or lock. So this means what? Means within one method, we can save we can create the object so it moves to the transient, save it so it goes to persistent, and after the persistence or after saving the entity, we can do some logic and then we call the session, the hibernate session dot detach, so it will move to the detached state. Once it's detached, we can also change some properties, for example, and then we can call back this uh, one of these methods save save or update and so and so forth so it will go back to this persistent state if if not or if we don't execute one of these methods so the entity will just go to the garbage so it will no longer become a hibernate managed entity okay so now let's go back to this persistent state so from this persistent state we we can move to this removed state all right so to move from persistent to removed we need to execute a method or a delete method all right so the removed is the state of an entity when it has been deleted from a database an entity is in the state in this state so in the in this state removed is no longer persisted to the database and is not being managed to by hibernate so once we delete an entity so it passes to the state removed and then automatically to the garbage okay and here let's talk about a little bit and explain this state or moving the object to the garbage as you can see right here, if we create an object, if so it's in the transient state, so from the transient state, it will move to the garbage if we do not execute any of these methods, okay? Once we persist an object and then we try to detach it, so, and then we, we do nothing, it will also go to the garbage, okay? Again, from this persistent state, once we perform a delete uh, operation, it will go to removed state. So it will the state will become removed and then it will move to the garbage again. Now we can go here from this state, from this author directly to this persistent state. So this means what? This means when we try to perform a, a get operation, find all, find by ID and so on and so forth, so we will directly go to this persistent state. So because here we, d we don't need to instantiate any kind of uh, data, but we just want to call our session management or persistent uh, persistence entity or entity manager to get or to fetch data directly from the database. So we move from this initial state directly to a persistent state, and then we can move to these different other states so we can perform a detach save delete or remove all right so this is the hibernate entity life cycle but here's something uh, something really important to know about so we with using spring data jpa we no longer need to care about all this life cycle because it's automatically managed first of all 
Second, so this save, persist, detach, and so and so forth is being handled in the background. So we don't need to automatically uh, commit the transaction or detach the entity and so on and so forth because Spring Data JPA will do the job for us. So now we know and we, and we understood what is the life cycle of our entities. Let's move on and explore other important things. If you have any questions, as always, do not hesitate to drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Previously, we've been playing around this author entity. Now, what about if we talk about this whole class diagram and how we can realize it? Okay, but before that, we see that we have relationships between the different entities. We have the many to many, one to many, and so and so forth. But first of all, what is relationship and why we need relationships? In, in a database, relationships between entities can be used to represent the connections and dependencies between different pieces of data. And there are several types of relationships that can be created between entities such as one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many -many relationships. Creating relationships between entities allows you to model the real-world relationships between different pieces of data more accurately, which can help you better understand and analyze your data. It can also help you to enforce data integrity and prevent inconsistencies by ensuring that changes to related entities are coordinated and consistent with each other. In addition to modeling real-world relationships, creating relationships between entity can also improve the performance of your database. By using relationships, you can avoid storing redundant data in multiple tables and instead use foreign keys to reference related data in other tables. This can help to reduce the size of your database and improve query performance. Overall, creating relationships between entities uh, is an important part of designing a well-structured and efficient database. It can help you to model real-world relationships more accurately, enforce data integrity, and improve the performance of your database. So when you work with SQL databases, always think about adding relationships. This is important to improve everything and ensure integrity or your data integrity. Now, before moving on and start implementing uh, this class diagram and um, creating relationships between the different entities, let's explain one small thing. So here we have, for example, this course entity and this author, we see that we have one relationship here. It's many to many relationship because we said that an author can create uh, multiple courses and one course can be created by multiple authors. So that's why we have the many to many relationship. All right. So here we have a question. This question is how can this relationship be done? And the answer is here we are not talking about annotations, we are not talking about anything, but the focus or the main focus in here is the type of the relationship. So here we can identify two types. We have a unidirectional relationship. This means that one entity has a relationship with another entity, but the other entity does not have a corresponding relationship within the first entity. This means that the relationship is defined only on one side of the relationship. This means what? Like when we talk a bit uh, code right now, this means when we create, uh, for example, the course entity and we want to link this course entity as a many to many relationship within the author. So we create an attribute or a list of authors uh, within the course uh, entity and give it the annotation many to many. 
and that's it so this is what we call a unidirectional relationship so it's from only one side now what if we want to make it be directional so in a bidirectional relationship both entities have a relationship with each other so this means that the relationship is defined on both sides of the relationship so first of all we created a list of authors right here and it's referencing the author now to make it bidirectional we need to create a list of courses in the author entity right now right here so like this we will ensure that we have a bidirectional relationship in general unidirectional relationships are simpler and easier to understand but they do not allow you to navigate uh, the relationship in both directions means you can you can navigate from course to author but if you implement unidirectional relationship you cannot uh, navigate from author to course so it only ensures one way uh, one way navigation but bidirectional relationships are more powerful and flexible but they can be a bit more complex and require more care to maintain the integrity of the relationship that it also ensure a bidirectional navigation from both sides so from author we can access the courses and vice versa now let's move on and start creating all these classes let's create let's create and implement everything we have right here let's start now by creating our entities so what we will do is we will create a java class and give it the entity annotations for each of these classes that we have right here but we will not do any um, any mappings any relationships we will just create java class course for example with an id title description and so and so forth so this is what we will be doing right now and then we will move on and implement and explain in details all these relationships and annotations that we can use so let's go back to our IntelliJ. I will close all these tabs and within our models package, I will right click and create a new class. I will call it course. So here, like as we did with this author, we can use the same annotations right here. So we need the data, no args constructor or all args constructor the builder and especially the entity annotation because we need it to make the class or the course.java class an entity but just i will copy paste them to make it uh, much much faster all right so this course right here let's go ahead and create a few fields we have an id we have a private string name and we have also a private string description. And that's it. So here we have our entity. Next, let's add the ID annotation because we need it. And we have also the generated value. And just a reminder, always make sure you use the jakarta.persistence if, if you are using the spring 3.0. Otherwise, it's still javax.persistence for the previous versions so generated value and we will leave the strategy to hibernate to decide which strategy is better for us next let's create the section entity so i will call this class section paste the same annotations we used before and now we need to create a private integer id and private string name the section name and also a private int order so we want to give an order for it for each section all right oh, okay. okay now as always we need this id annotation and we need this generated value annotation right here Okay, so that's it within this section uh, entity. Let's move on and create the next one. Let's now create the lecture entity. So right click right here, new class and call it lecture. As always, just paste 
the annotations that we will need. And now let's create an integer ID attribute. And then we need also the private string lecture name. So that's it. We have only an ID and a name within the lecture. And now let's add the ID annotation and the generated value. So this should be an easy task for you. And let's move on and create the next one. Now we will create this resource entity, but for the moment we will not create this uh, inheritance video file and text, but we will leave it for later when we will explain the inheritance within Hibernate. All right, but for now, let's just stick to this resources entity and create the following attributes. So go ahead, right click on the models package, create a new class and just call this one a resource. Always paste the annotations and we have here a private integer ID, private string name, resource name and private uh, int size. And we have finally private string URL. So this represents the URL of the resource. And do not forget the ID and the generated value annotation. So that's it. Now we have all our entities created. Let's now move on and start implementing the relationships one by one. Now let's start establishing and creating relationships between our entities. So let's start from here. Let's create the one many to many relationship between the author and the course. And as we explained before, an author can create multiple courses and one course can be created in collaboration of multiple authors. That's why we have the many to many relationship in here. Now let's go back to our entity J. And as we mentioned before, when we talk about many to many relationships or many relationships, the first thing that we need to think about is creating lists. Okay. So let's open our author entity and scroll down here. And first of all, create a private list. The list is always from the Java util package. And we want to create a list of course. Okay, and let's call it courses. So this is the first step. Second step, go also to this courses uh, entity and in here, create a private list of authors. Okay, uh, author and let's call it authors. All right. So this is the first two steps. Next, we are talking about many to many relationships. So let's add many to many right here and many to many also on the course level. So now we defined or we have our many to many relationships. Okay. But now we need to define something. We need to define the owner of this relationship. So because we have the owner and the reverse relationship and in many to many relationships in JPA, one of the entities is considered the owner of the relationship and is responsible of maintaining the foreign key values in the join table. And the other entity is considered uh, the inverse of the relationship and does not have any foreign keys in the join table. All right. So to do so, once you decide which of them should be the owner of the relationship, just go to the other one that you wanted to be the inverse relationship and give it uh, the map it by attribute, like give it the value. All right. So for our case, we want the course to be the, the owner of the relationship. So the author is the inverse relationship, right? So within this inverse relationship, add this map it by and the map it by should be, or we should provide the name of the attribute we have right here. So here it's called authors, just go copy and paste it in here. Be careful about making typos. All right. So if you make some typos, this means that you can also have exceptions at the application startup. 
Okay, so now let's go back to the owner of this relationship. So for our case, the owner is the, the course. And now to define the, the, the joint table of this relationship, we define it from the owner side. So here we will use this joint table annotation. And here this means or this has a goal uh, of creating a new joining table between our author and courses. Okay, so uh, for this join table, let's provide some properties. First of all is the name. The name is will be or will hold the name of the join table. Let's call it authors courses means the courses of authors or like you can call it whatever you want. Next we need to define the join column. And here we can we can define multiple join columns, okay? So the join columns right here equals, and now we need to pass a list of join columns. I will just make it a new line so it, it will be more readable for you. And now we will use the annotation join column, okay? It's always Jakarta package. And for this join column, we will, we need to provide the name and the name right here, let's call it. Uh, so this join column is the one responsible or the one that will hold the information or the primary key of the owner of the relationship. So this one will be the course ID. Okay. Next, once we define the join columns, we need to define the inverse join column. So when we talk, when we say inverse, we are talking about the inverse entity. So here, inverse join columns right here equals, and as the same way, here we need also to use at join column. So join column, and let's give it a name. And here, let's call it author ID. So like this, or in this way, we just defined a many to many relationship between our author and course. And to check that, let's just restart the application and see the impact in the database. And also let's check the logs. So here we see All right. So here we have uh, we have one exception, and you see right here because it's caused because of this syntax error near order because in this lecture the sorry in this uh, section the order is a reserved name. Okay. So let's just rename it to section order, right? Or position or something like that. Let's restart the application again and see what happens. All right, so let's first check the logs. Here we have everything is working fine. And here we are creating the sequences for each entity. You see that for each entity we have, or we are creating a sequence. And here we have the author. We are creating the author and the course. And also we are creating the author's courses, the, the join table that we created for this author and course entity. We have also the lecture resources and so and so forth. And here we are creating all the constraints, all right? So, and also here we are inserting because we still have this bean right here. So if you want to stop it, just comment this bean out, comment this out and it will no longer insert, insert data. So now let's go and check our database. So here, refresh it. And now we should see at least the author, author course and courses. So here we have our columns. So we see that we have this ID, age, email, and so on and so forth for the, uh, from the author. And we have from the course, 
we have these three columns that we just defined, ID, description, and title. And now from the author courses, we see that we have two columns and you see for the primary keys, it's a golden key, but for foreign keys, it's blue key. So now we see that we have this course ID, which is referencing the course and the author ID, which is referencing the author entity. All right. So this is how we can create many to many relationships. Let's move on and see how we can implement relationships between the other entities too. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. At this level, let's implement the relationship between the course and the section. So a course has m m zero or many sections, so or one or many sections, okay? And one section, if we take one section, it belongs to only one course. So here we have one course to many sections and we have many sections to one course. So how we can also explain this? So when we create a course, we have the course, but every time we create a new section, we will have a foreign key course ID that will be associated within the section class. All right. So let's see now how we can implement this. So at this level, we are talking about the course. So, and we said that one course has many sections. So here, when we say that, we have one course and many sections. So list of sections and let's call it sections. Okay. So this is the first step because we have one to many. So it's always the, the current instance or the current object, which is the course has many sections. So we create a list of sections right here. Okay. Now let's go to the section you can do a command click or control B for Windows and Linux to navigate to the definition of this. So here we said that many sections can figure out or many sections belong to one course. All right. So here, this means that we need to create a private course element right here or um, a field of type course right here. Let's call it course. Okay. Now, from now to implement the mapping. So we go back to this course.java where we have the list and it's easy. Like when we have the list, always think about one to many. So it's just as we explained it, it's one course, it's one course to many sections. So one course to many sections. All right. And here, when we use one to many, we need to map it or to tell which mapping that we need to use. So here map it by, and this map it by, it should be the exact same attribute name we have right here. So just copy paste it and be careful always about typos. So here we have this one to many. Now let's go and navigate to the section entity. So within the section right here, we said that many courses or many sections. So we said that many sections, they belong to one course. So we have many to one. And when we use many to one, we need to specify the join column. So when we create a course, when we create a section right here, what should be the join column name? All right. So here we need to add or to use the annotation annotation join column and let's give it a name right here and the name, let's call it course ID. Okay. So now we just created a mapping or a relationship between the course and the section. So let's restart the application and see the changes. So the application just started right here and we see that we have all these entities. Now let's go and check our database. And now what I'm expecting is to see a foreign key called course ID within this section class. So let's do it. Refresh the table right here. 
and let's check this section so within the section we have four colon this is good and we see that we have four one foreign key and this foreign key is this one so we see it's uh, fk let me make it a bit bigger so we see that this uh, fk stands for foreign key and this is the id of this foreign key so the I, the name or the key of this attribute is course id and it references to the course okay so it references the course id that we have within this course table okay let's also check again the columns right here so we see that we have an id name section and course id so like this we are able to create or to make a relationship between two entities using one to many okay let's move on and implement the next and if you have any questions don't hesitate to drop me a message now let's implement this relationship between the section and the lecture and it's also one to many as we did for the course right here so this i think it's an easy task for you and let's go ahead and implement it quickly so from the section level right here we said that the section has a list or a list of uh, lectures or many lectures so let's go ahead create private list lectures okay and let's call it lectures and now let's move to the lecture and create or reference it within the object that we have so here we have private section section and now let's add the mapping okay so we say that we have one section one section to many lectures and this one is mapped by section okay so it should be just a reminder it should be always the same name that we have here now from the section level as we explained before it's one section to many uh, it's one lecture to many sections and here many sec many lectures can belong or they belong to one section okay so here we have many to one and do not forget to add the join colon and give it a name and let's call it section id all right so that's it let's restart our application and check the diagram and check that we have all the foreign key correctly created and here if we go to this lecture i'm expecting to have this foreign key right here which is section id referencing the section and also for the columns we have the id name and the section id as a foreign key right here so that's it let's move on and implement the one-to-one -one relationship between the lecture and the resource now when we talk about a lecture and a resource we talk about one-to-one -one relationship because one lecture has only one resource and when we talk about one resource it belongs only to one lecture so that's how or that's from where we got the one-to-one -one relationship okay just as a reminder this part we will see later on now let's go back to our code now in order to implement a one-to-one -one relationship so first of all define your uh, your entities and in here we have uh, our section and also we have our resource so from the section level let's create a private resource let's call it resource okay so when we talk about one-to-one -one relationships we can talk about one uh, unidirectional or b-directional mapping okay so we can link the lecture to the resource and that's it so we will have uh, the owner of this relationship is the lecture and we can access the resource from the lecture but when 
we want to go back uh, or access the lecture from the resource, we will not be able to do that because we don't have a bidirectional relationship. So let's start with unidirectional relationship. Now, in order to define a one to one relationship, as I mentioned, create an object of the, the other entity. So in our case, it's an object of type resource. And here we need to use the one to one relationship. Okay. So here we have the one to one, we can also define the join column name that we want to use. And here, let's say resource ID. All right, so this is how we can define a one to one relationship. And then let's restart the application and see the impact of this. So now we see that the application started, let's check the database. Now, if we go to the lecture, we see here that now we have two foreign keys. The first one is from the resource, the one we just created. And the second one is we the one we previously created from the section. But here we need to focus or we want to focus on this resource ID from the resource. Okay, also, if we open this one, we can see that we have a, a new uh, column defined here, which is the resource ID. Okay. Let's go now and implement the second way or like the bidirectional one to one relationship. So just to make it faster, I will just copy these annotations, go to the resource entity. And as we did before, let's create a private lecture. And let's call it lecture right here. Okay, and now let's paste this one to one annotation and join colon. And this one, let's call it lecture ID. So here, this means when we want to create, um, when we want to create a new lecture and a new resource, we need to link them together in order to have this bidirectional relationship. Okay, so as we mentioned before, like having bidirectional relationships, make it a bit complex to maintain all the foreign keys. All right, so let's go back, restart the application and check the database. So the application is starting right now, let's open the database and see, refresh it. And let's see now from the resource, we will see that we have one a new foreign key which is the lecture ID and it's referencing the lecture right here. So like this, we just created a one to one relationship between lecture and resources. All right, so that's it. We just implemented all the relationships between all our entities and classes. Let's move on. And I want to show you how you can check that what you created is the same as your class diagram. Now for the people having the, ulti the ultimate version of IntelliJ and using this database to check the data and refresh the data and refresh the database and check the tables. So there is one thing that we can do. So here, when you click on this database, you can right click on it. And here we have in the bottom, you have diagrams. Okay. And you can show a visualization or you can show it in a pop up. Let's sh show the first one. And here it will generate all the tables of our database. Okay. So you can also, uh, you can also click on this icon to apply the current layout and it will reorganize it. And here we see that we have our author right here we have our author table let's just try to organize it a bit and we see right here within this diagram that we have the same one as we already designed at the beginning of this of this course so we have the course and the author and here we have the the join table between this to one because we have a many to many we also have a relation between our course and section and the same between section and lecture and we see that we have this one to one relationship between our lecture and resource all right so like this or this tool might help you checking if you have 
the correct implementation or if you did the correct implementation or not. So just go ahead, use it, and you can also compare it with this diagram that we just created. So just double checking, we have author, courses, section, lecture, and resources. And it's the same diagram that we have generated right here. So this one, it will use the database and all the relationships that we already defined to draw this schema. So uh, that's it about all the relationships. Now let's move on to a bit more deep and important uh, stuff that we need to learn together. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop me a message, send me an email or contact me on social media. And also you can go and ask your question on Discord. I will create a special channel for this course. So just go ahead and ask it. Otherwise, let's move on. Previously, we said that we will leave this part right here where we have this resource, video, file and text entities to uh, a further part. So now it's the time. So here, as we can see, so this is the symbol of inheritance and we have this resource class. We have also these three classes, video, file and text. So this means what? This means that a resource can be at the same time, um, can be whether a video, file or a text. So here we have video extends resource, a file also extends resource and same for the text. So in Spring Data JPA, you can use inheritance to define a base class of your entities and then create a subclass that inherit from the class or from the base class. So this can be useful if you have a number of entities that have some common properties and you want to avoid uh, duplication code or duplicating the code. Okay. And when we talk about inheritance in Spring Data JPA, there are several ways to implement this inheritance. So we have the single table strategy. Also, we have the joint table strategy and table per class strategy. So we will see all of these strategies in details. But here we need to talk before we go and we, before we leverage inheritance, we need to talk about pros and cons for each one, for, for this inheritance. So the pros or the advantages of uh, inheritance is first of all, code reuse. So because inheritance allows you to reuse common code among multiple entities. Also simplified queries, with inheritance, you can create queries that span multiple entities without having to write separate queries for each entity. Now let's talk about the cons or the disadvantages of inheritance. So first of all is the complexity. Inheritance can make the database schema more complex, especially if you are using a strategy like joint table per class or table per concrete class. Also, we can talk about rigidity because inheritance can make it more difficult to change the base class or add new subclasses because it can affect the entire inheritance hierarchy. So this means every time you need to add a field or you need to add a new attribute within the base class, you need to really be careful about the subclasses or the derivative classes that extends this base class. So this is mainly the pros and cons of inheritance. Before we move on and start implementing the inheritance strategies, I want to highlight something which is really important, which is composition over inheritance. Because both inheritance and composition uh, are ways to achieve code reuse and modularity in object-oriented programming. In general, it is recommended to favor composition over inheritance as composition is more flexible and easier to, ch to change. Because inheritance evolves creating a subclass that is specialized version of a base class, so the subclass inherits the properties and behaviors of the base class and can also have additional properties and behavior of its, of its own. 
This can be useful way to share code among multiple classes, but it can also make the code more rigid and difficult to change. If you need to make a change to the base class, it can affect all the subclasses that inherit from it, which can be difficult to manage. Composition evolves creating a class that has reference to one or more subjects and delegate tasks to these subjects. This allows you to combine the functionality of multiple classes into a single class without the inheritance hierarchy of a base and subclass. Composition is more fle flexible than inheritance because you can change the object that a class delegates without affecting the class itself. So in summary, it is generally recommended to use composition over inheritance because it is more flexible and easier to change. However, the best approach will depend on the specific needs of your application. So this is the comparison between inheritance and composition. And as I mentioned, it's, al it's always recommended or generally recommended to use compositions over inheritance. Okay, now let's go and dive into these inheritance strategies in case you want or in case you need to use inheritance within your application. So let me teach you how to use it in the correct way. Now imagine with me that, that we want to add some auditing fields to our entities. Uh, means I want to add some information to track uh, the creation and the last modification of each entity or of each line uh, of my tables in the database. This means for, for example, this course entity or this course class, I want to add four field uh, like the created add, last modified add, and also created by and last modified by. Same for author, section, lecture, resource, and all the tables that I will create within my database, okay? So in this case, uh, I will have four fields, including this ID, we can count five, in each entity. But this is okay from the database. But now when we talk about the code, our code, I want to avoid this code duplication and I want to organize it much, much better, okay? Here we can use one technique to achieve this one. And it's gonna be something like that. We will have a kind of base entity or we can call it abstract entity or a parent entity, you can call it whatever you want. And in here we will move or we will try to, um, to collect all the common fields between the entities we have or between the Java classes we have. And for example, we have this created at last modified at created by and last modified by. And I want all these fields to be part of all the entities I have within my database. So for this, it's super easy. Here we will use inheritance. We will create a class. We will call it base entity and all the classes I have right here, they will extend this base entity, okay? And this base entity needs to be annotated with a special annotation. And this annotation is called map superclass. So this annotation indicates that a class is a superclass that is mapped to a database table. And this annotation is used to define common properties uh, that will be shared by multiple entities without creating a separate table for the superclass. This means the, the only existing or existence of this base entity is within our code. But from the database side, we will not see any table called base entity. So now let me show you how we can do this. Let's go back to our IntelliJ. And here within this models uh, package, let's create this new class. Okay, so let's create a class, call it base entity or base class or base table, call it whatever you want. So this base entity, first thing that I need to do 
is I need to give it a mapped super class entity. And as you can see, it's always from jakarta.persistence.mappedSuperClass. So this means, and this, this will indicate that this class is a mapped super class and any entity that will extend this one will inherit also all the fields that we have right here, okay? And for this, I will create a private local date time. Uh, this one, for example, created add. I want to add a private So this one last modified at, and I want also to create two strings. For example, this is, this is this is just an example, and you can create or you can move all the common fields that you want into this base entity. So here I will create a string created by. So to track who created this entity. I mean like the, the user who created this entity and we have also last updated by or last modified by, okay? All right, so here within this mapped user class, we can use all the, um, all the Jakarta, all, all the persistence um, annotations like colon, uh, last modified by, last created by, and so and so forth. So it's a normal entity, but it's just within our Java code base, okay? Now also let's check right here for all the classes or for all the entities that we created right here, we have this integer value, uh, this integer ID, which represents the ID of our entity. So also, if you have always the same name for um, for, for all the entities, what, you, what we can do also, we can also move this entity right here to this base entity, right? We can use this field right here. So now we can see that we have this ID generated value and so on and so forth. I will also just go ahead, add some Lombok annotations to generate the getters and setters and so on and so forth. All right. So I will just copy this one and I will give you a small hint, which is super important uh, here when we work uh, with Lombok. So here we see we have all the getters and setters, but here within this one, this is gonna be the parent entity and we want to use a builder. When we use a builder within uh, a derivative class or the, the child class, we will not be able to access these fields right here. And to do so, uh, Lombok, they created uh, an annotation called super builder from the for, for, for now it's from the package lombok.experimental and might be moved uh, later on but the annotation is called super builder all right so here what we need to do first is use this super builder with all the entities that we will that will extend this base entity or in any case if you have inheritance between your classes and you want to use this builder annotation just go ahead and use this super builder instead all right so now let's go back to this author and uh, this author entity and we see right here this one is in red because we don't have the primary key but once we extend our base entity this error will move on Okay, so this this is now is this is now gone. All right, and also when we use inheritance and we use this data annotation, we we need also to add the equals and hash code annotation. All right, and here it needs to call the super. So these are some hints for you when you want to use correctly all the annotations from Lombok and also from uh, from the persist uh, from the. JPA or Java Persistence API. Also go ahead and check my course about Lombok and the useful annotations that you can use and also how they work. All right, let's move on right now. I will also make these changes to all the entities we have right here. And when we restart the application, we want to make sure that we have everything as we had before. Plus, I want to see these four fields right here. 
okay so I will go ahead and do it for all of them so what we need to do or the way we need to implement this so let's first replace this builder with super, super builder and let's extend the base entity next we need to remove this ID field with this with the annotations and that's it so this is how we can extend or this is how we can inherit from this base entity and keep everything working fine also don't forget to add the equals and hash code annotation let's do the same for lecture and so this one extends base entity let's move this id field you can skip this one like for the rest of the entities if you are familiar with that and here and i will also do adding equals and hash code all right so next one is resource same thing here let's also extend our base entity right here and remove this id field next one is section and then we will restart the application and see the changes so let me remove this and extend the base entity all right replacing also the builder with the super builder and here we also need to add the equals and hash code and then you can optimize the imports to have your code as clean as possible all right so here what we have or this is what we have right now let's go first and check the database make sure that we have everything as before before restarting the application let's make sure that we have the same structure and the same tables that we have right here okay so now go ahead and start the application because i stopped the application that's why we don't have any tables right now because we have the property create drop but let's start the application first so everything is started and we have all the all the entities but we don't see that we have a base entity getting created and this is what we expect now i will refresh the schema right here and we see that we have these six tables right author and this is the the joint table and if i open this author i see now i have nine columns including this created add created by and last modified also I still have the same ID and this ID is inherited from this base entity so this is how you can uh, group the common uh, the common fields within one entity and this can make your your code uh, a bit cleaner and you can group and if you want for example to change the type from local date time to for example just uh, a java.sql uh, dot date here instead of this local date time you can do this change only in one place instead of doing this change in all the places also for example if you want to link this created by and last modified by to the real user table in the database you can just update and modify in one place so this is how the, the mapped super class works and as I mentioned, uh, like finally, before we end this part, using the mapped super class annotation can help you avoid duplication of code and make it easier to maintain common properties in large applications. However, keep in mind that the mapped super class does not have its own table. So do not forget this one. And if you want to use a mapped super class entity, so do not expect to have a separate or its own table. And it cannot be queried or persisted directly. So we cannot query this base entity and we also cannot persist this base entity. It can only be used and a base class as a base class for, for entities. All right. So if you have any questions, don't forget to drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Now let's talk about inheritance within this part of our class diagram. All right, so we have here, just a reminder, we have our resource, video, file, and text, okay? So let's first prepare and create these three classes. Right here, I will create class called video, file, and text. And then let's explain and 
see how we can implement the difference the different uh, inheritance strategies okay so let's go back to our IntelliJ and here again with these models uh, with this models package I will create three uh, three classes but first I want to go and open these resources and I will just roll back all these changes I mean I will um, I want to use this integer right here why because we cannot extend multiple entities or multiple classes uh, using Java all right so this is the only and unique uh, reason for that so because our focus right now is the inheritance uh, regarding this resource otherwise I will I can also show you how how we can do or how we can uh, implement multiple inheritance all right okay so uh, this is what we have right here and now I will just go ahead and create my first class I will call it video and this video it will have also the same uh, without the entity I will just copy this the these annotations the Lombok annotations but here instead as I mentioned before it will be or it should be super builder and for this video I will have uh, right here a private int length so it's just the length of the video. I will create another class like we have right here. We have file and text, okay? Now I will create a file class. So this file, it also will have the same annotations and here I will use the super builder instead. Do not forget also to update uh, or improve the imports. And here I will have just private private string type. So the type is just to say if it's, um, for example, PDF, TXT, Word, and so on and so forth. All right, let's create now the third class, which is text. Also, do not forget to paste the, the Lombok annotation and change this one to a super builder. And within the text, we have our private content attribute private string content and that's it now we have the three files or the three classes that we have video file and text and now we can go back and start explaining and implementing the different inheritance strategies using spring data jpa let's first see the single table strategy so this strategy is a way to map an inheritance uh, hierarchy to entities to a single database table this strategy is used in hibernate or uh, spring data gpa or mainly when we talk about the java persistence api so jpa to define how inheritance is implemented in the database with the single table strategy, all subclasses of the inheritance um, of the inheritance hierarchy are mapped to the same table, and then we talk we or we need to talk about a discriminator colon is used or we need to use it to distinguish between the different subclasses. So the discriminator colon contains a value that indicates which subclass. Uh, a particular row in the table belongs to and within when the single table strategy is used all of the properties of the of the parent entity class and its subclasses will pers will be persisted to a single table the discriminator colon is used to determine which subclass a particular row belongs to now, the single table strategy is the simplest way to implement inheritance in the database, but it can lead to an efficient queries and a large table size. It is best suited for situations where the number of subclasses is small and the inheritance hierarchy is not deep. So this is theoretically uh, how single table inheritance works. Now let's try to implement this. First of all, to implement the single table, single table strategy, so we go first of all to the parent class 
or the base entity or whatever you can call it whatever and in our case this is uh, this is our base entity or the parent class but first of all here this one needs to be super builder because if in case you need it later on and now here we need two things we still have this entity annotation which we need and we need also to add this inheritance annotation and the, and it's the one from always jakarta.persistence all right and within this inheritance uh, annotation we can define uh, we can define the strategy and here we can see that we have joined single table and table per class all right but as you can see right here by default it's using single table so whether you precise single table or not it will be by default single table okay so you can just use inheritance annotation without the strategy so it will take as a default value the single table all right so this is the first step now let's go to this video files and file and text and in here optimize the import first let's call up this one and now within this uh, this video i will just add the entity annotation okay so the same and here from this video we need to extend our resource because a video is also a resource right and don't forget with this data annotation from Lombok, when we use inheritance or we extend another class, we need also to implement the equals and hash code with the attribute or the property called super equals true. This is just a reminder for you. Let's go ahead and do the same for file. So here we need the entity annotation. And now we need also to extend our resource entity and then we need to add the equals and hash code annotation let's do the same for text entity let's extend a resource right here and finally we add the equals and hash code annotation all right so here we have everything up and ready for us okay now let's restart the application and see what will happen with only this configuration that we wrote right here. So click on restart. So now the application is up and running and we see that we have no exceptions. So everything is good so far. Let's move this one and here let's go back to our database. Click here and update or refresh the database so we have the inheritance within the resource uh, column and we see now that we have nine columns within this class okay so we see here that we have uh, id name and so and so forth but we see here that we have the extra field. and we see here that we have the size this one the this is the one coming from uh from the from the file or from the video we have also the type we have the content and so and so forth we have also the length and what happened right here with this basic configuration so hibernate he grouped all the um, he grouped all the fields within the the parent uh, the parent entity so everything now is within this resource and if we want, for example, to create a content and so on and so forth, if we want to create a new instance of type text, we need to fill all the information, including all the information from the resource, including the content. Okay. Now let's try to, to give some more differentiation between the entities. All right. So let's see what we can do as extra configuration to make this more clean and more beautiful to use. All right. So now let's talk about this discriminator value. This discriminator value will give a value that we will specify in advance to each type or to each derived class. So for example, if we give uh, the value V for video, F for file and T for text, we will add uh, a colon called type right here to the resources. And then this resource type, every time you create a new instance of video, this type will be automatically V 
F for file and T for text. All right, so let me show you how we can do that. So here we have our inherent inheritance strategy, which is single table. Now we need to add an, another annotation, which is discriminator colon. And this one, it's just to give the discriminator colon name. And here for this name, by default, it's D type. If we do not, if we do not precise this colon, by default, it will be D type like we have right here. Okay, so it's the discriminator type. But let's give it uh, a special name. Let's call it resource type. All right. So from the parent uh, class or the parent entity, we need to add this discriminator colon to specify the colon that we want to use. Otherwise, you can leave it to the default one, which is D type. All right. Now let's go to the different uh, different entities. Now after this entity annotation just go ahead and add a discriminator value. So the, this discriminator value, let's, for example, as we mentioned before, let's give it V for video. I would just copy this annotation and paste it in the different entities, F for file and T for text. So now if we restart the application, we will see that instead of this D type colon, we will have our resource type colon right here. So I will restart the application and here the application is restarted. Let's open the database and refresh it again. So refresh this resource table or all the data, uh, all the database. So within this resource, we see that we still have nine colon and now our colon is called resource type, all right? And we have this name size and so on and so forth. Those are the attributes that we have from all the children classes, all right? Now, if we create a new instance or if we want to persist a new file, we will create all, uh, we will insert all the data, including, uh, for example, for the file right here, we have the type. We will say, for example, PDF right here and all the information and automatically this resource type will be V. So the value of this resource type, it will be automatically uh, F, sorry, not V because F is for file. So it will be F for file and it will be V for video and so and so forth. So you don't need to worry about um, to, you don't need to worry about filling this resource type because every time you create an instance of the children or the child class, it will be automatically filled using this discriminator value. All right. So this is how it works. And in the next step, I will show it to you in action. I will, um, we will insert uh, for example, a new file or a new video into the database and we will see what will happen. Let's see now in action how we can, uh, how this is gonna look like, all right? So I will close everything right here. And in this repositories package, I will create um, a sample repository for this uh, entity called video because I we want to check only one of them. So here I will create a new class. I will call it video repository. So for you, in case you want to use uh, inheritance, you need to create, of course, one repository per, uh, per entity, okay? And uh, here, let's extend JPA repository and let's give it the type video and of course, Antigr for the ID. So this is our repository right here. It's ready to use. Now let's open our main uh, class or made our JPA application class where we have the spring application repository and I will inject right here our video repository. I will call it video repository. Okay. And I will bring back this bean annotation. Okay. So uh, this is going to save this author, but I will just comment this out because I don't want to insert any other lines. So uh, now let's use this video repository to insert one data. So I will have here var video equals 
video.builder.build. So for this video, I will just precise or give some information like um, the name, for example, uh, ABC dot um, length. Let's check our video right here. We have the length and let's say, for example, it's six minutes or five minutes. It's also OK. And let's give it another uh, another information, which is the I, th I guess that's it. OK, so let's give it just the name and the length. And here, let's use our video repository dot save this video entity. OK, and now all we need to do is restart the application and see what will be inserted in the video or in the resource table into our database. Let's restart now. So the application is restarted and we see also that we inserted something into uh, the into the resource table and here we see that we have this resource type but we did not precise it just to remind you here we don't have we have only the name and the length okay let's check this resource table right here i'm going to refresh the database or the table and then double click it to show the content so we see the content right here that we have, first of all, we have V for the resource type, and this is something that we did not precise. We have the ID name, we have the size, which is zero because it's an int. That's why it's zero because int by default equals zero. And we have the URL type and so on and so forth. Also, we have the length that we precised. So we have the name ABC and the length equals five and the resource type is V. So if we do the same for file and text, it will be F for file and T for text. So this is how single table strategy using discriminator colon and discriminator value, this is how it works. So if you have any question, just go ahead, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on and check the next strategy. Now let's comment, first of all, uh, this being annotation, close this class and now we will talk about the next strategy which is joined table. This strategy, each subclass in the inheritance hierarchy is mapped to a separate table with a foreign key pointing to the base table. This allows each subclass to, has, uh, to have its own table with only the properties that are specified to that subclass. Okay, so when the joint strategy is used, each subclass will use or will have its own table with a foreign key pointing to the base table. This allows each subclass to have only the properties that are specific to that subclass, which can lead to more efficient queries. However, it also requires multi more tables and foreign keys which can make the database schema more complex. The joint strategy is a good choice when you have a large number of subclasses with significant differences in their properties and you want to optimize the performance of your queries. However, it's not suitable for situations where you need to query the entire inheritance hierarchy at once. At, as it requires multiple joins to retrieve the data. So these are, let's say, the pros and cons of this strategy. Now let's see how we can implement this. So let's go back here to our resource. Let's collapse this one and let's go back to our resource entity. So now instead of this inheritance, first we need to command out this one because we don't need this discriminator column anymore. And now for the strategy, instead of single table, we will use the joined one, all right? So this is the only required change from the base entity. So we have this entity and again, the inheritance with the joined strategy and no discriminator column is needed. So this one, I will just type it right here only with single table.
all right so you don't mix when you when you directly check the code you don't mix with this annotation right here all right so now let's go to the subclasses let's start with this video right here for example and now for this video we don't need these discriminator values so let's go ahead and remove them all because now as we mentioned we will have uh, a table per subclass okay so that's it this is how the join table works let's restart the application and check what will happen so now the application is up and running let's open our database and refresh it so refresh it right here so we see now that we have this file we have this text and we have this video table so let's check the columns here we have this content and the id also we have one foreign key which is this id which is pointing to the resource all right so this text table contains only this content which is the attribute that we specified right here let me make it uh, in both sides so we have only this content right here and we have this id which represents the primary and the foreign key at the same time because we see right here that we have these two icons the blue one and the golden one so they point to the same uh, to the same thing so it's primary and a foreign key at the same time and we will see the same thing if we open this video right here so we have also the length and the id and now let's try to insert some data we have already something in here within our jpa application let's bring this bean back let's restart the application and check what will happen so now the application restarted and we see here that we have uh, two insertions instead we just have we just created a query or we just inserted one element into our video table all right so here what we have we have this video dot builder and we have we precise the information of the video but we see right here that we are inserting into resource and we are also inserting into video so let me show you how this is represented as data in the database so first of all i will open the resource let me make this one full screen so here we see that we have the id we have the name which is abc the one that we specified and we have this default values for the rest of them if i open the video right here i see that i have this id colon which is as i mentioned which is the primary and the foreign key at the same time and we have the length that we specified so automatically hibernate inserted two elements or two lines into uh, two different tables because we have our strategy as joint okay now let me uh, show you something you might also want to do in case for example you want to give a special or a custom name for this id colon which represents the foreign key we can use an annotation for that all right so let me make it full screen i will keep the bean for now and i will just comment it out once we are finished with this uh, join table strategy all right so within this uh, entity or within this entity called video which is a subclass here we can use an annotation called primary join colon okay so this primary join colon we can give it the attribute name and here i will call it um for example video id all right so now when i insert or i restart the application and we will insert some data we will see that this id right here this colon right here id it will now be renamed to video id let's restart this so first of all we can see it already in the insertion query so when we insert into video we have length and video id also if you scroll a bit up and you check the codes of creating the, the table video we have length and we have video id instead of id so by default it will use 
the ID name or the ID name field of the parent class. So in this case, it will use this one. But if we want to customize it and have our own name for each entity, we can also use this primary key join column. So let's open this video and we see right here, it's now called video ID. All right. So uh, that's it. So this is how joined table works. Again, before we finish, let's go back to our JPA application and let's comment this out. And in case we need it, we will bring it back again. All right. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop a message, write me an email, contact me on social media. Otherwise, let's move on. Now let's see the table per class strategy. So the table per class strategy, uh, each concrete subclass in the inheritance hierarchy is mapped to a separate table. Abstract subclass are not mapped to a table and their properties are inherited by their concre concrete subclasses. So you may ask the question, what is the difference between this joined table or uh, and also the um, you might ask the question, what is the difference between the, the strategy joined and the strategy table per class? So it's super easy. Let's check. Now we still have the joined table right here. So here we have the resource that contains the columns of the base entity or the parent entity, which is name, size, URL, and so on and so forth. And each subclass contains only its own uh, its own attributes with the id in plus all right now when we talk about a table per class this means that we will have a table with uh, a table video for example with all the attributes from the resource table joined into this text table all right so this is the main difference this means that we will create a table per each subclass so when the table per subclass strategy is used, each concrete subclass will have its own table with a copy of all the properties inherited from the base class. This allows each subclass to have only the properties that are specific to that subclass, which can lead to the most efficient queries. However, it also requires the most tables and can make the database schema more complex. So in case you have multiple inheritance or many subclasses, so your schema might be uh, a bit complex than the normal. So the table per class strategy is a good choice when you have a small number of subclasses with significant differences in their properties. And do you want and you want to optimize the performance of your queries? However, it's not suitable for situations where you need to query the entire inheritance hierarchy at once, as it requires multiple tables to retrieve the data. Now let's see this in action. Let's see how we can implement this table per class strategy. So the implementation is super easy. There is not uh, there is not a lot of things that we need to change. So first of all, let's go back to our base entity. And here, instead of inheritance joined, let's use table per class. All right. So this is the first change. And I will just go back to the video right here and comment out this primary key join annotation because it works with the joint uh, strategy. So that's it. All we need to do to mention here that we want to use a table per class. Now let's see the impact when we start the application and then we will see or let's also comment or bring back this bean annotation and let's see what will happen when we insert a new video within our database. So let's see the, the, the schema changes and also the impact when we insert data. So first of all, we see here that we have only one insert, which is inserting into video and we have a lecture name, size and so on and so forth. Now let's see how this is represented in the database. So now I will go back here and click on refresh. And we see right here that we have this, for, for example, this video, um, this video table right here 
we have our uh, we have our all the attributes and we have the size and so on and so forth so we have all the attributes from this resource table and we also have the attributes from the video all right so if i open this video we see right here that we have the id name size and so on and so forth so we have all the information joined into one table per subclass and if we check also for example file or text we will find the same thing so here we have six columns and this is the content or the attribute that we have from the text all right so um, now this is how inheritance works with hibernate let's go ahead and check a few issues that we might face when using inheritance and how to solve them when we work with inheritance we can also query the base entity so we can define the strategy that suits us and we can also or we want for example to retrieve all the resources of our database okay it's like uh, select star from resource and that's it or like using the find all method all right but we have one issue is when we query this resource table we want for example just to get all the informations or just the attributes of this resource entity and we don't want to get any information about file text video and so on and so forth i just want the resources not the subclasses of that so this is this one like in the background so in the background when querying the base class which will return all the subclass records as well by using a union statement in the background and the use of union can also lead to inferior performance when choosing this strategy another issue is that we can no longer use identity key generation all right so when we use this this type of inheritance we might face the issue of polymorphic queries so as mentioned querying a database class will retrieve all the subclasses uh, entities as well now if we don't want uh, a subclass to be returned by the type of the query we only need to add the a hibernate annotation to to say or like to uh, exclude it from the definition so for example if I want to exclude this video right here, if, if I want to exclude this video entity when I want to query the resources, I need to add one, one annotation to exclude it from the parent when I query the parent. All right, so this annotation is called polymorphism. And here I need to give it a type. So polymorphism and the type right here, it's polymorphism type dot explicit because by default it's implicit means when I query the resource dot Java, it will automatically query all the subclasses from that one. But if I say I want it to be explicit, this means that it will query this video only when it's required or only when I ask for it. Otherwise, it will not uh, it will not create it, okay so this is how we can solve the polymorphic queries issues so just go ahead use this annotation and exclude all the subclasses that you don't want to query okay so if you have any questions don't forget to drop me a message otherwise let's move on in this chapter i want to teach you how to work with embedded ids or embedded entities generally speaking all right first of all let's define what is an embedded ids or embedded entities okay so in software we come across many use cases when we need to have a composite primary key to define an entry in a table the composite primary keys are that use more than one column to identify a row in the table uniquely so within one table we can define more than one column to be the unique identifier of that column okay so we represent a composite primary key in spring data jpa by using the embeddable annotation on the class level
This key is then embedded in the table corresponding uh, entity class as the composite primary key using the embedded ID annotation. We will see all that in details. But first, let me give you a use case for that. So here, like I have this other table, other table one, other table two. It's just an example to tell you that this is an independent database. So now let's take the case or the use case of a microservice. And now we will talk about the order microservice. All right. And here we have, for example, this order table. So this is just uh, an illustration example. It's not a real life example, just for illustration. And here, let's go back and we take this order table we have right here. And we don't want to rely on generated IDs. Okay, I don't want to create a generated ID, which is auto incremented to be my unique, uh, my unique ID of of this table, but I want to have my own ID, I want to create my own ID. But this ID, I want it to be composed. Why I want it to be composed? It's not just a want, but it's a need. Why? Because in real life, one user can order or can um, pass or validate many orders in one in um, at the same time or in one day, for example. Okay. So uh, in this table right here, we can find the same username multiple times. So this means that we cannot rely only on the username. Okay, so we have also we have here order date. And the order date itself, we cannot just rely on this order date, because at the same time, even at the same milliseconds, we can find more than one user ordering uh, something. All right. But when we talk about the composition, when we talk about username and order, both of them, this is unique. So both of this username, the combination of the username and the order date, it's unique. This means like the unique identifier of one order will be the username, for example, Alibu as a username, and the order date, let's say the 0101-2023. Uh, at, uh, for example, let's say midnight. Okay, so at this time, only we have only one user, this Alibu user, he's the only one passing this entity, uh, this order, sorry, not the entity, but the order. Uh, but we can also find another combination at the same order time, but within another username. So like the combination of username and order date is something unique and we can rely on. So this is the use case or one of the use cases when we need to use embedded IDs. All right. So now let me show you in action. Let me show you in real life how we can create embedded IDs and how we can use them within our entities. In order to demonstrate that, let's first create and prepare the ground for that. So to use embedded uh, entities and using the embedded IDs, what I will do, I will create a sub, pro, a sub uh, package within this models package. And there I will put all the, um, all the entities and all the resources related to this embedded ID exa example. So right click right here on the models and then I will create a new Java class. I will call it order ID. And this order ID, I will create it um, within the package embedded. Okay. So I will just call a pack, uh, create a package called embedded. And within this package, I will create my class called order ID. Hit enter. And now we have our package and also we have our, our entity. So now, in order to, to create an embedded ID, so first of all, you need to define the IDs or the attributes that you want to rely on to use that as an ID. And uh, as our case demonstrates, so we want to have something uh, composed of uh, username and date on and or we can call it order date. So I will first of all create a string username 
and here I'm just assuming uh, that the username is something unique so we don't have two users with the same username then let's create a private local date time let's call it order date so this is the username or this is the entity well actually it's an entity but it's not a persistent entity it's something like the map super class the one with the example we saw before but it's not a persistent entity it's just a composition where we can compose multiple uh, attributes and we can use them as as an embedded id so first of all we need some annotations i will use the data from lombok all args constructor the no args constructor and here I will use one annotation which will make this one an embedded embedded entity so here the annotation is called embeddable and this embeddable comes from jakarta.persistence because we are using spring 3 this is just a reminder so let's use this embeddable annotation using this embeddable annotation will tell hibernate and spring data generally speaking that this is an embedded entity now how to use it i will show you just right away so within this embedded package i will create my order class or order entity okay so i will call it order and here i will just copy this information So these are the annotations that I will need. And of course, my class is an entity. So we need the entity annotation. And first of all, I will create a string. Um, let's call it order info, for example, and a private string, another field because our focus is not about the fields but it's just uh, to say that we have few information or few fields within the order entity so now we see the same error that we know here when we create or we map um, a class or a java class with the entity annotation so it will claim about an id so here it says that this persistent entity order should have a primary key and here it as it's asking to add an attribute or an id attribute for us as we mentioned before we don't want to use an auto generated or an auto increment id but instead we want to use this order id class we just created so first of all i will create an instance of that or a field of type order id and i will call it id all right so for now we have this order id but it's still not known as an id for this entity now to make it to make this one an id we use the annotation embedded id all right so this embedded id right here so here we see we also still miss something but first I will I will go back to this in a few seconds first I want to show you and I want to go quickly to the documentation of this embedded ID annotation so here it says apply to a persistent field or property of an entity class or mapped superclass so here you need to focus its entity class or a mapped superclass to uh, denote a composite primary key that is an embeddable class the embeddable class must be annotated as embeddable so this is the annotation we already used also there, there must be only one embedded id annotation and no id annotation when the embedded and id annotation is used so this means when we when we want to use the embedded id annotation we cannot have another id annotation within this one all right so next it says that the attribute override annotation may be used to override the column mappings and so on and so forth and this one we can also skip you can I, I will get you can have the time to to read it 
And here it says, if the entity has a derivative primary key, the attribute override annotation may only be used to override these attrib those attributes of the embedded ID that do not correspond to the relationship in the parent entity, okay? And here also you can see an example. We have, for example, this employee primary key with this embedded ID. And here we see that we have this dependent ID annotated with the embeddable annotation right here, okay? So this is a bit uh, and quickly the annotation of this embedded ID. Now let's go back and check this error right here, okay? So here, it says that the class order ID should implement the serializable. So when you want to use an embedded ID, absolutely think about extending and implementing the serializable interface. Okay, so this order ID should implement serializable. So the serializable is the one from java.io package. Now, if I go back to the order, now the error is gone and I have my entity. So within this embedded package, I will create my order class or order entity, okay? So I will call it order. And here I will just copy this information. So these are the annotations that I will need. And of course, my class is an entity, so we need the entity annotation. And first of all, I will create a string. Um, let's call it order info, for example, and a private string, another field, because our focus is not about the fields, but it's just uh, to say that we have few information or few fields within the order entity. So now we see the same error that we know here when we create or we map um, a class or a Java class with the entity annotation. So it will claim about an ID. So here it says that this persistent entity order should have a primary key. And here it as it's asking to add an attribute or an ID attribute. For us, as we mentioned before, we don't want to use an auto-generated or an auto-increment ID, but instead we want to use this order ID class we just created. So first of all, I will create an instance of that or a field of type order ID, and I will call it ID, all right? So for now, we have this order ID, but it's still not known as an ID for this entity. Now to make it, to make this one an ID, we use the annotation embedded ID, all right? So this embedded ID right here. So here we see we also still miss something, but first I, I, will, I will go back to this in a few seconds. First, I want to show you and I want to go quickly to the documentation of this embedded ID annotation. So here it says apply to a persistent field or property of an entity class or mapped superclass. So here you need to focus its entity class or a mapped superclass to uh, denote a composite primary key that is an embeddable class. The embeddable class must be annotated as embeddable. So this is the annotation we already used. Also, there, there must be only one embedded ID annotation and no ID annotation when the embedded and ID annotation is used. So this means when we, when we want to use the embedded ID annotation, we cannot have another ID annotation within this one. All right. So next, it says that the attribute override annotation may be used to override the column mappings and so on and so forth. And this one we can also skip. You can I, I will get you can have the time to to read it. And here it says if the entity has a derivative primary key, the attribute override annotation may only be used to override these attrib those attributes 
of the embedded ID that do not correspond to the relationship in the parent entity, okay? And here also you can see an example. We have, for example, this employee primary key with this embedded ID. And here we see that we have this dependent ID annotated with the embeddable annotation right here, okay? So this is a bit uh, and quickly the annotation of this embedded ID. Now let's go back and check this error right here. Okay. So here it says that the class order ID should implement the serializable. So when you want to use an embedded ID, absolutely think about extending and implementing the serializable interface. Okay, so this order ID should implement serializable. So the serializable is the one from java.io package. Now, if I go back to the order, now the error is gone and I have my entity, okay? So if I start my application, I should see my order class or my order entity created in the database and I should see a composite primary key. Okay, so let's go ahead, click start and check these updates. So uh, let's check the logs. Okay, here we see an exception. So the exception is we have a PSQL exception and this is because we have a syntax error near order because the order is already a reserved uh, keyword. So to solve this, you already, you already know the solution. Let's use the table annotation, okay? Let's give it a name and let's give it underscore order right so now restart the application and we should see everything working fine right now all right so the application now is running we, we check we don't have any exceptions no issues and also we can check the logs and you will see that we have our order table getting created okay so now let's go ahead check our database refresh and see so here we have this order table. Let's open it and we have already four columns. So for these four columns, we see that we have this order date and username. Both of them, they contain or they have this golden key icon. So this golden key icon is the, the primary or is the icon of the primary key. So our primary key in this database is the order date and the username, both of them concatenated. All right, so if we check the keys right here, so we see that we have this underscore order underscore P key, so it's order primary key, and it's a composed or uh, composed key, and it's composed already of this order date and username. So this is how we can create an embedded ID. In case you need to create a, an embedded ID, now you have the knowledge to do it. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. So now we saw one example or one usage of this embeddable annotation. I want to show you another one. Let's go back to our diagram right here. And for this order, for example, we want to have or we want to add some information about the delivery address. But we want this information to be uh, embedded within the same uh, the same entity or the same table right here. So I don't want to store the address or the delivery addresses in a different table, but I want it to be within the same table order right here. You might say this is so easy to do. All I need to do is within this order entity right here, I just declare the information of the address, okay? But yeah, the answer is yes. But imagine we want to use the same address object also to store the address information with our tables within the same database or within the same schema. So like this, what I need to do is to duplicate the code in each entity which is not good, okay? We have a better solution. Okay, the second one, you might say, we, I can use the method super class and extract all these entities and just extend my entity with this address entity. 
I say, okay, this also feasible, but if you have multiple inheritance right here, if you already, for example, extend a base, a base entity, or if you extend another, or you have inheritance, you with uh, within your database. So what should be the solution? The solution can be using the embeddable entities. All right. So with this within this package embedded right here, right click and create a new Java class. And let's call it address. Okay. So this address, first of all, we will need the same uh, Lombok or the same basic Lombok annotations right here, data all arc constructor and no arcs constructor. And now I will just create few dummy fields. So here I will have a string street street name, private, also another string house number, for example, uh, house number, it's a string just in case you have one A, one B, one C. And private string zip code. So it's also string, it might start with zero, and so on and so forth. So let's not focus so much on, on the fields right here. But our main focus is to understand how this embeddable works. So once we create and once we define all the attributes of our embedded entity, as we did in here within this order, we need to use this embeddable annotation. Okay. So let's use this annotation right here. And like this, we just created our embeddable entity. Now I will show you how you can use this embeddable entity as an attribute within another entity. Now let's go back to our order class and within the other fields that we created, I want to create a new field of type address. So I will create an address and I will call it address. All right. So now I want to tell that this address is an embeddable entity within my order entity. All right. So I, I already mentioned the solution. So let's use the embedded annotation. Okay. So here we have embedded ID and this is embedded and let's check quickly. What is this embedded annotation? So it specifies a persistent field or property of an entity whose value is an instance instance of an embeddable class. So the embeddable class must be annotated as embeddable. All right. So the attribute override attribute overrides and so and so forth may be used to override mappings declared and default or defaulted by the embeddable class. So here you can also override some attributes when you use this embeddable class. All right. So this is the embedded annotation. Now let's go ahead, start and test it. Click on restart right here. So our application is up and running right now. And let's go ahead and check the database. So now I will just refresh the database and let's see what will happen right here. So within this order table, we see right now that we have seven columns. And here we see that we have the house number, street name, zip code, and so on and so forth. So the, the fields of the address are now included or embedded within our order table. So if you want to do, or if you have a need and use it usage uh, like that, or use case like this one, always think about using embeddable entities. All right. So embeddable entities will make your code much, much easier and uh, improve the granularity of your code and your code will be really reusable. All right. So because this address uh, entity or this address uh, class right here, we might use it in many places. So in order to duplicate, uh, not in order, but instead of duplicating the code of uh, the fields of this address class, just create an embeddable entity and use it or call it whatever you need. If you have any questions, go ahead, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Previously, we explained the hierarchy of the Spring Data JPA 
uh, interfaces and how this helps us and provide us with methods and predefined methods to search data and create data from the database. So now we cannot talk about Spring Data JPA and not talk about querying data from the database. And querying the data means reading and writing and also deleting and all the interactions and the trans transactions that we can make with our database. The Spring uh, Data JPA and the repositories and the JPA repositories, they provide us several ways to dynamically generate queries at runtime. So these are called uh, query generation from method names or also known as query derived query methods. Okay. And these derived query methods, they allow you to define queries based on the method name and uh, of the query method you are calling. So for example, if you want to find the author right here, let's first, before going to this method right here, let's just recap and remind about what we have. So we created before an interface called author repository because we have an entity called author right here. And this author repository interface extends already the JPA repository, which is a generic interface that takes two parameters. The first one is the the entity in question and the second one, the ID type that we use within this entity. Okay, so this JPA repository will use the author.java, our entity that we created. And just a reminder, with the author, we have these IDs or this, sorry, not IDs, but these fields. We have an ID, first name, last name, email, and age. Okay, so here within this author repository interface, which extends already the JPA repository, as I mentioned before, we can create methods. Okay, so it's an interface and you know, within an interface, all we need to do is the return type, whether it's a function or a void, and then the method name and the parameters. This is how we create methods with within an interface. So as I mentioned, Spring Data JPA provides us a, a way to dynamically generate queries, okay? And we called it uh, derived queries or derived methods. So this is how we can write it. So here, as I mentioned, it's the return type and then the methods that we want to, okay? So let's explain this example right here. We have this list of author. So our method will return a list of authors. And here we have find by last name. And we have our last name or LN as you, you can call it as you want as a parameter. So what will happen in here? So this find by last name method generates a query that search uh, the users or search the author with a specific last name and this method right here, for example, this find by first name and last name will generate a query that searches um, the authors uh, or the user by first name and last name. Okay. We can generate other queries like, uh, like in here, for example, we can count. We don't have only the find by, we can also count. We can also delete. We can also do as many operations as we know in SQL using the derived query methods. Okay. So for example, if I want to count all the authors in my database by age, so all I need to do is to write the return type and spring data JPA will take care of the conversion. Okay. So the count all by age within the age, it will create a query that counts all the authors in this author table by the age and return this value. Also, if, for example, uh, we have already the delete methods that we can use or the predefined delete methods, but if we want, for example, to delete uh, the, the list or we want to delete a list of authors by age, all we need to do is delete all by, and then we have age like by, and here it's followed by the property that we want to use. Okay. So 
Let's explain a bit more. Here, in order to generate one of the, of the methods right here that will create a query behind the scenes at the runtime, all we need to do is we have find by and then followed by the property. Okay, so this is the, the simplest way. So it's find by and then followed by the property name and depends on the return type right here, uh, Spring Data JPA will determine what to return exactly. So here we have find by, so it will search everything from the database and return the result set, okay? But if we have, for example, here an author or an optional of authors, so I will explain the difference. So an optional is the design pattern uh, null pointer. So this is a wrapper to wrap this author object within this optional class right here. So this find by email, Spring Data JPA will, will search the author by email from the database and then return a type of uh, an optional of type author. Okay. So also the same here, we have this find by email, but in this case, we will return the author. So Spring Data JPA will do nothing except creating an object author and just return it. Okay. So here, as I mentioned, we have the find by followed by the property and then you can create as many methods as you want. Okay, so this is the first one. Also, we can use find all by, so they both work in the same way. We can use find all by last name, find all by first name and so on and so forth. Okay, now we can also combine uh, properties. Combine means what? We can use uh, operators such as and and or. So I can search the list of authors by first name and last name. Okay, so here we see we see that we have find by first name and last name and we need to pass these two parameters. Okay, so fn for first name, ln for last name. Okay. We can also use, for example, let's go back to this method. I want to ignore the case when I want to query all the, all the authors or the list of authors from my database. So here we can say find by last name and then follow it by ignore case. Okay. We can also use other operators like not, like we can um, f use find by last name like. So means this uh, contains and so on and so forth. Okay. So we will see all this in action. We will see how we implement or how we can implement these methods. Okay. So I hope this part is clear. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Now let's see all this in action. So first of all, I will teach you how you can how you can write these methods. So as we explained before, first of all, we start with the return type. So here, imagine we want to fetch the list of authors from our database and from this author table by first name, for example. Okay. So when we say that I want the list automatically think about having a list. Okay. So here you can whether work with list, array lists, collections, and so on and so forth. But I always recommend using interfaces. Don't use classes, use interfaces. So in order when you want to change the implementation, it's easier. Okay. So let's go back. So here we have a list and then the type. So we want a list of author and then you have this find by so automatically when you type find by and you have the type as list, so it will automatically transform it or map it to a list of authors. You can also, when you, when you work with lists, you can also use find all by. Find all means that you want to search everything. Okay. So they both work in the same way. So let's use find all. So then here, if you have the IntelliJ, the ultimate version, or for the people who are using another IDE, which provides auto completion. So here, when you do command uh, space or control space, 
you will see that your IDE will propose the list of properties or the attributes that you have within the author, okay? So, and here you can have a look on the generated, uh, the generated or the auto-generated properties, which are automatically detected from this author entity. Okay, so we can see age, for example, and even within the age, we can see that we have a lot of methods, okay? So imagine we have all these methods uh, within only the age property. For example, if I want to search all the authors where the age is null, so I only need to query um, find all by age null, age not null, age not like, not in, and so and so forth. So you can have a look and all, and on all these methods and we will explain most of them, okay? So here, for example, I want to search all the authors by first name. So all I need to do is to type first name, okay? And within this first, first name also, I can see that I have a lot of auto completion. So after, before, between, uh, by the way, not all of them are applicable because when we say uh, first name after he mainly we, we are talking about dates okay before also dates and between and so on and so forth so you need to be careful not everything auto generated here is usable or applicable for this specific property okay but you will learn it by the time so now this find all by first name is completely sufficient now I need to provide my parameters. So here uh, you need that you have the same type like in here and then just type any name. I will call it F name just to just to mention and to make sure that this works. I don't need to pass the same here, the same attribute name. Also one thing worth mentioning and it's really, really important. So you see this first name right here. If I go to my author uh, entity, you see that we have the first name is written in exactly the same way. So we have first and the name with the capital N. Okay. So if you go back here, you cannot say like this. You cannot call your method like this. So it will not be detected. It will not be highlighted as an error, but within your IntelliJ or within your IDE, it might be highlighted as an uh, as a warning, but not for other cases, but this worth mentioning. So here, all the only thing that you need to change is the first letter because you are using camel case. So what you, what you need to do is just copy the field that you want to use and until you get used to it. Copy it and then here just paste it and then the you change only the first letter to a capital letter, okay? So like this, you will have the method or the exact method that will work for you. And if I change this one to, for example, a lowercase, we see that it's highlighted and here we see that um, cannot resolve property first name. This means that my IntelliJ or my IDE, he automatically detected that this first name property is not within this author entity, okay? So here you need to always be careful about this. All right, so this is the our first method and this one will search all the lists or of authors from our database by first name. Now let's try and see how we can improve or how we can extend this, this method, okay? All right, so let's try how we can extend and improve a bit this query. Just as a reminder, I want to remind you that this query is the equivalent of this one. Select star from author where first name Uh, I will use it as uh, as in the database. Uh, let's say this is a native query equals and here we have our first name as parameter right here. So this is the same exact query. Now, now let's answer the following question. What if I want to find all the authors from my author table 
where first name equals any, for example, equals this. And I have in my database, the users are all in capital letters, okay, are all uppercase. But I want to ignore the case. I want even if I want even to pass when I pass this Ali as value, I want always to query the data. So within this method right here, and this generated query right here, passing this value Ali and having all the first names in the database equals or in uppercase, this will not work. This will return an empty list. Okay, this will return nothing. Now let's try to extend this query and make it ignore the case. All right, so here we have find all by first name and I already gave you the answer. We need to add one property which called ignore case. Okay, so when we say ignore case, now it will accept this query right here. Okay, and it will return some data. All right, so this is good. Now, what if I want to get all the data or all the authors from the database where the first name contains this one, for example, contains AL, all right? So, and also I want it to be also ignore case. In order to do so, I will duplicate also this method. So here we have find all by first name, ignore case, we can also add containing. So we need find all by first name, containing, and then ignore case. So as you can see here, we can concatenate and we can use multiple uh, use multiple uh, filters within the same query method. Okay, so here we have find all by first name. So this is the attribute name and then the condition that we want to use or the clause, the where clause that you want, we want to use containing. So containing will be the equivalent of this one right here. So it will be something like that. Okay, so it's going to be like percent percent. So this is the exact same thing. And also we want to insist that we want to ignore the case. So here be careful, it's property, condition or we're close, and then the refinement if we want to refine our query, okay? So now I want to, so this one, I hope it's clear, otherwise you can drop me a message and I can explain it a bit more. Now I want to get all the authors where the first name starts with this and also ignoring the case. All right, so in order to do that, let me just keep this as it is and I will duplicate this method. So I will use it always as a base method. I will copy or paste uh, this query right here. So I want, as I mentioned, to search all the authors from the database where the first name starts with this. So here, instead of containing, I will use starts with. So here, when we use this starts with, the query will be transformed or will be generated exactly like this, okay? And also here, we want to ignore the case. Now, let's take another, another case. Let's play around with these queries because it's really funny. So here, instead of starting with, I want all the first name that ends with, okay? That ends with, uh, sorry, sorry, I just made a mistake. So starts with, it's like that. So it's AL and then anything because this percent means anything, but ends with is the opposite one, okay? So I'm sorry for that. So here I need all the queries or all the authors from the database where the name ends with AL. So it starts with anything and ends with AL, all right? So here I will duplicate the same method. And here instead of starts with, I already gave you the answer. So I need to use ends with. And you can see that this ends with ignore case will it transform and will create this exact same query in the background, okay? 
So uh, we can also we can also add and play with so many attributes and as I mentioned like after the first name or after the property name within your IDE you can click on control space and you will see so many methods okay so starting with ending with also you can check if the if the author or if an author exists with this first name uh, you can also use uh, in and so and so forth. Okay, so um, for example, if you want, for example, if you want to generate this query, so I want the list uh, of authors from the database where the first name in. For example, I want to filter only for, for example, Ali. I want to get all the authors where the name is whether Ali or Boo or coding. So here it's super easy. As I'm as we mentioned before, let me duplicate this method. And here instead of ends with I need to pass in. Okay? So and also here ignore case. So I want to find all the names or all the first names uh in from the author table where the first name is in a list but here we we need to pass a list of strings okay so to pass a list of strings so whether we pass a table or we pass a collection okay so here we need to pass a list of string as the first names i will call it first names and this will generate behind the scenes this exact same query. All right. So you can play with these methods, with these filters, and you can generate awesome queries out of this. Now let's move on and try something else. Now before moving ahead and going deep into these derived query methods, let's play a bit with what we created right here. So to do so, we will go to this Java application here where we have our command line runner bean and we need to insert some data into our author table. So enable in order to be able to play with these queries. But here we face a small issue, which is that if we want to insert multiple data, I need to every time to create, for example, if I want to insert 50 uh, authors into my database, I need to duplicate this code 50 times and each time I need to change the first name, last name, age, and so and so forth. But to do so, we can use a dependency which help us to fake data. Okay, so this dependency is called faker or called Java faker. So it will automatically generate uh, data for us, including, for example, first name, last name, emails, and so and so forth. Also, it can generate generate address and so and so forth. All right. So uh, first of all, let's go ahead and insert and add this dependency. So open the pom.xml file and go down to the dependencies right here and after the project Lombok, add the following dependency, okay? So add the dependency uh, tag and within the artifact RD, it's called Java Faker. So it's the second one, not the fixture, but it's the second one, Java Faker. So select this and then it's from com.github.javafaker, right? And the, the most recent version at this time is the 102. If you have more or a recent version, just go ahead and choose it. Then click on this load Maven changes and that's it. You will have the Java faker within your project. Okay, now let's insert some data. First of all, don't forget to bring back this bin annotation. Let me make this full screen. And then we need to comment out this one. And to comment this out, all, we, all you need to do is select it and then go to code. And here you have this comment with block comment. Okay. Now let's bring back this code right here. And what we will do, let's create a loop. 
So I will do for int i equals zero i smaller than or less than, let's insert 50. And here we have i plus plus. And let's move this code inside. Now, instead of this first name and last name, I will remove the email or let's let's keep it like that. The age, we can also keep it. Uh, but here, instead of this first name, last name, what we will do here, I will create a faker. I will call it faker equals a new faker. Okay, so this is how we can use our faker uh, object. And now for the first name, I will use faker dot name. We see here that we have this name object, which returns a name. And from this name, we have first name, name, last name, full name, and so on and so forth. So we need the first name last here. And also let's use the same one for the last name right here. So instead of first name, let's use last name. Okay. Now for the age, we can use our faker dot number. And here we can generate a number or a random number between two digits, for example, and the age I want uh, my author to be between, for example, 19 and maximum, let's say 50. Okay, so it will like this, it will generate an age or a number between 19 and 50. Okay. All right, so now we can just run our application and make sure that we have all our authors inserted into the database. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay, so here we forgot that our email should be unique. So to do that, I will just do something like this, just to fix it quickly. And here I will co concatenate it with, uh, with I, okay? So it will be contact zero one and so on and so forth. So like this, we don't have the applications. I will restart the application and see. So now we see that we have the insertion logs. Let's go ahead, refresh our database and check. Let me move this, refresh the data. And here we have our tables. And now let's go and check our author table. Okay. So we see right here that we have this email and we see that we have this first name, last name, and so on and so forth. And the information that we provided also the age, but now let's make uh, this insertion permanent. And I, because here, if you're, as you remember, when we start the application and we, uh, we made this DDL auto right here, like just to remind you the configuration, the DDL auto we created is create a drop. So all we need to do is to make this one to update. Okay. Uh, so when we make it update, every time we will start the application, we will not lose the data. So this is what we need to do. So in order to do that, just go ahead, make this property to update like this. And then we need what we need to do is to restart the application. So we can insert the data. So just follow me on this, restart your application. And then we will have the data inserted. So here we have in our database, let's refresh it. We have this data right here. And this data will be persisted like always. Okay. And then we go back here in order to make this data always persistent, just go back right here and you can just comment out this insertion or you can also keep it. But here we want to play with this, um, with this part right here, but let's comment out all this for loop. So let's use a block block comment. So we no longer have this code getting executed and to make sure that what you did is correct, just go ahead, restart again the application and make sure that you still have the data. So here we should not see any uh, SQL log telling that we, that we are inserting. And as you can see, the application is already started and nothing happened. So also if I refresh 
my database if you open the table right here click this refresh button you see that we still have the data okay also let's just to double check let's refresh this open and we see that we have the data right here okay so now we have permanent data within our database and now we can play with it now i want to give you a small exercise so here we prepared everything we have all the ground we need to run our tests so now i want you to play within this repository this author repository and the methods that we already generated right here so within this command line runner or if you want you can create a service and some endpoints and you can play with these methods but just go ahead and test this uh, find all by methods and see the output okay so i hope you like this exercise if you face an issue drop me a message otherwise let's move on well done after you played with all these method methods that we created together now let's move on and check something else so here we have our author table already inserted with data and we can see here that we have email first name last name and age and uh, for this one i just want to highlight one thing because here for this email what I used here, I used the faker.name.username because I'm sure that this username will give me a unique uh, username. And then I, I made a concatenation with the at alibucoding.com. So you can also do the same. Also for the age, you can, uh, you can use the faker.number and then number between and it will give you a random number between 20 and 80, for example. All right, let's go back here. Now we have uh, the data inserted. Now, what if I want to update, for example, the first one, which has uh, the ID equals one. I want to change the email, first name, last name, and age. Okay, so it, in order to do that, it's so easy. Here, we will keep uh, this one, and also I will keep the bean because in the application uh, here, I have create drop. So this means every time I start the application, I will get my data inserted. Okay, so after inserting the data, what I want to do is I want to create or I want to copy paste this one or I can copy the whole code. And here I want to update author with ID one. All right, so in this case, what I will be, do, uh, what, what I will be doing is I will create an author object and here I will just change the data and here I will make it first name Ali, last name Bo Ali and the age it will be my age for example and the email I will move it back as it was. So contact at alibucoding.com and then of course I will need, uh, okay, I forgot repository.save here and then I need the same thing here. So now this one it will insert this um, this this author but if i do dot id here one so this means that we will update this author and let me explain how this works so this save method first of all it will, it will check the id so if we have uh, if we have an id the first thing that it will do it will try to fetch any object within this ID so it will make uh, select all or select star from author where ID equals one if the hibernate can find data what it will be doing it will be merging or updating all these fields okay otherwise if for example I pass an ID equals 1 million or 100,000 so it will not find any object within this ID in this author table. So it will decide that it will be an insertion or creation of, an, of a new input. Here you need to really pay attention that when you pass an ID, the ID should exist in the table. You should already know the ID in order to update something. So now let's move on and rerun the application so we will we will have all this information but the element or the first one should be alibu uh, ali bu ali and with the email contact at alibu.com all right so here we see also that we have all this insert and then you you see here that we have a select and then an update so the first select is 
checking if we have the author with the ID that, that you specified in here, which is the ID one. And then we have update author set age and so on and so forth. And then where ID equals the, the ID that we passed as parameter. So now I will just refresh this, this one. And you will see that if I search for the ID number one, which will be at the end, we see here that we have the urge 34, uh, alibucoding.com, uh, Ali and Bo Ali as a last name. So this is a way of updating the data. Now, what if I want, for example, just to update this one or this one, or only I want to update age or all the ages of my um, of my table. So for example, what if I made a mistake and and I want to fix all the updates or I want to update all the ages of all the authors in the author table. So in this case, I need to write one query which will update everything. So I don't have uh, a condition right here, like I don't have an ID. And if I want to use this method, I need first of all to find all the authors from the table and then I have to loop over them and each time I need to set the age and of course I need to pass the ID and then repository.save. But there is an easier way and we will see it just right now. So what I want to do now is running the following query. So I want to create a method or create a mechanism that will allow me to update to run the following query, which is update author and then set or let's call it a set a dot age equals 22, for example. And here, let's start first of all with where a dot id equals one, for example. So I want to have or I want to execute this query. So it's exactly the same thing like here, but I want to use the JPA or the rip my repository right here. So here I have the author repository and I will show you how you can use this repository in order to run or to create update queries. So first of all, go to this author repository and I can just copy this one. And then what I will do, I will create a void or let's create an, an int uh, method. So update author, just update author, it's, it's okay. So in order to update the author, we need to pass an int age and then int id because we want to update the the age of the of the author having the id 1 for example and here as we mentioned we want to run this following query so in this in order to do that so we will use the query annotation and then this is our query so it's update author a set a dot age equals 22 where id and now the id should be like this right so this id will refer this one and the age should be also age. So this query does not support update uh, methods or update instructions, but we need now to tell uh, Spring Data JPA that this is an update query. And in order to do that, all we need to do is to add this modifying annotation. So when we have this modifying with this query right here, Hibernate will understand that this is an update query. So now if we go back here and if I comment this out and then if I do repository dot update author and I pass for example 22 as age and I pass one as an ID and rerun the application we will see that in the author table we will have or we will find that we have an update. Okay, here we see that the application did, did not run and we have already one exception. So we see that first of all, we started to insert everything and then we, we got an exception fail to execute command, command line runner and then executing an update or delete uh, through, through an exception. So let me explain to you what is the reason behind that. So the reason is that this update method that we have right here was not or is not transactional. So so in order to do that or in order to fix that, we need to make this modifying query transactional because the modification or the update need to be within the same transaction. Okay, 
So in order to fix that, all you need to do, so here you need to put in mind that when you use the query and modifying, then you need also the transactional annotation. So with these three annotations right here, modifying transactional and query with the update query, we will be able to update our, our author. So now let's run again and let's also check the, the output. So we see here that we have all the inserts that we have, but now we have no select as we saw before, but it's directly updating. So update author set age where ID equals something. So let's go back to our, and now if I scroll down and I see this one, so we see that the ID number one has the age 22. And also if you want to make sure you can just put one age equals equals 100, for example, since we know that all our authors uh, ages are between 20 and 80. So now we can make sure that we updated the correct one and also the update method or the update query is working as expected. So now we see that the age of this uh, guy right here is 100. So our update query is working. Now, if you want to, or now let's try to update all the all the ages or the ages of all the authors that we have. So first of all, I will create void, update all authors, for example, ages. And here I will just pass an int age. And I will also copy this one. And all I need to do is removing this where close. And now I will duplicate this one, update all authors, and I will set the age to 99, for example. This one we can comment it out and I will rerun the application. Oh, uh, we missed something already. So here it we need to use the update all authors and the age 99 and I will remove the ID. So let's start again. Okay, so we see here that update author set age equals to something. And if I refresh right here, I should see all the ages equals to 99. So this modifying query and this modifying annotation right here is really useful if you want to do a bulk update and you want to update many things at the same time. So you don't need to loop over uh, the data and set this, set that, set this, set, set that. So all you need to do is to create an update query. And then if you need, and also don't forget, if you need these workloads, you need to add it. Otherwise you will be updating all your data. In this part, we will see together the named queries. So in Spring Data JPA, named queries are useful in a variety of scenarios uh, for organizing, optimizing, and maintaining query definitions in your application. And some common uh, use cases includes uh, encapsulation, for example, of your query logic. So named query help you separate query definition for the rest of the application logic. Also named query uh, are reusable. They also help us optimize the performance of our application because they, um, the named query are validated and parsed and often optimized during application startup. So when you have a named query, it will be parsed, validated, and optimized on the application startup. Also named queries uh, are, uh, are centralized. This means named queries allow you to store your query definition in one place, either with an entity class or an external XML file. This externalization simplifies query management and makes it easier to update and refactor the queries. Let me give you some specific examples when to use named queries in a Spring Data JPA application. So first of all, when you have complex queries that are used in multiple places throughout uh, your application, when you want to optimize performance for frequently executed queries, when you want also to improve code readability and maintainability by separating query definitions from other application logic. And finally, when you need standard way of organizing and managing queries across your application. So these are the use cases or some of the use cases of named queries and the definition also of a named query, but you need to keep something important in mind. While named queries offer uh, several benefits, it's, Im it's important to note that they may not always be the best choice. 
for every situation. For example, they might not be as flexible as dynamic queries. For example, when we use query DSL or criteria API, also when it comes to building uh, queries based on varying condition or user inputs. It's essential to evaluate your specific use case and choose the appropriate approach for your application. All right, now let's move on and implement our named query and let me show you how to do that. To create a named query, first of all, you need to go to the entity or to the model where you want to create that query. So here we have two options. First of all, we can use this annotation named query or we can also use named queries. So we have two options, okay? Also, we have another one which is named native query or named native queries right here. So you can also create native queries as named queries. So for this case, let's move on and let's go ahead and create JPQL named queries. So first of all, we will use a single one and I will show you how you can use this uh, named query and then I will show you the use case or the usage of these named queries. So first of all, as I mentioned, we, when using named query, we need to give it a name and the name always think about having uh, the entity name or your model name dot the name of the named query. So I will just say find by named query and then I will provide the query itself. So let's say, for example, for this one, I want to do select A from author A, this is just the alias, where A dot age is greater than, greater than or equal, for example, to the age I want to pass as a parameter. So now I have a named query, which will fetch all the authors by age where the age is greater or equal than a specific parameter. So now in order to execute or to use this named query, just go to your repository right here. And now we want to execute this query. So it will be return a list of authors. And then we have find by. And as you can see, IntelliJ is already proposing this one and also you see that the icon is slightly different from the from the native one or from the predefined ones. So here we have find by named query. And also as you saw here we have it's a named query. So all we need to do is to pass our parameter using the param annotation and then age. And then of course it's of type int, so it's gonna be int age. So that's it. And here you see already the difference that we have this icon and when you click on it, it will navigate us to the named query, okay? So now in order to use this one or to check it, all you need to do is to go here to the JPA application and then after executing and updating and doing all that, what I will do, I will do a list of authors equals repository dot find by named query. And here, let's say, for example, I want to fetch all the users having or all the authors having an age greater or equal than this. Yeah, so this one should be or should go inside. And here it will be find by named query. And then I can do, for example, for each system dot out dot println. So I just want to print all the authors that will be here. I guess we can also remove this one. And now let's execute our application and let's see the output. So here we see that we have all the authors and here we just forgot to remove this update because by this we updated all the authors and we set all the ages to 99. So it will retrieve all of them. So now let's see, and here we have a restricted list and as we can see here we have all the users where the age is 74 71 and so on and so forth so for example if i change this one to 70 or 77 something like that yeah okay and if we run again 
we will see that we have we will have or we will get a shorter list so you see that we have only two with the age 71 and 70. all right so this is how we can create a named query let's move on and let me show you how we can create a list of named queries and how we can create another type of named queries now let's update data using named query so let's try to recreate the same uh, query right here but using the named query so first of all i will just copy this one and then i will go back to the author and i will create another named query right here and then I will give it a name. So the name will be author.update by named query. And the query will be the one I just copied. So here it will be update author set age where ID equals something. But here I will just remove this ID. And I want to update all the, all the authors. So again, I need to go back here so it will be a void update by named query and this one of course we need a parameter which is the age and then int age all right so let's double check so here we have a variable age so we need to pass it and this is what we did right here now let's go back after uh, displaying all this data now update with named query so all I need to do is my repository dot update with name or by named query. And here I will pass, for example, 12 as an age and I will execute the, the application again and check what will happen. So it seems that it did not work. And now I guess and I'm pretty sure that you know why it did not work. And the answer is so let me first show you the, the exception failed to execute command runner and here it says expecting a select query but we got an update so the answer is that is the one you already thinking about we need this modifying and of course we need the transactional annotation so even if it's a named query if it's an update query we need always to use this modifying so let's run again and check and now we see that we have this update and then if i open my table right here and I will see that all the ages now are 12. So that's it. Also, before um, before we move on to the next steps, here you see or we mentioned already that we can use named query or this annotation named queries. The difference between this named query and named queries, actually there is no difference because if we go to the source code of this annotation, we see that we have or we can pass a list of named queries so it's just a way to organize our named queries so we can do something like that and we can move these named queries inside and that's it so th this is the only difference between the named queries and the named queries so you can whether have them separately or you can also group them within a, a list of named queries and nothing will change it will be always the same everything will, will, will remain the same all we need to do is just group them with named query